Welcome along this Saturday afternoon. It's unbelievable. The show that gets you thinking, and I've got a really fascinating guest for you over the next couple of weeks who's joining us. Uh, I'll tell you all about him. Don't forget that towards the end of the show today, you'll hear feedback on previous week's programming. Thanks to all of those who have been involved in our Igniting the Faith appeal over the last couple of weeks as well. It's wonderful to have the support that Premier Radio does have from its listener base. And whether you're listening today live across the country or via our podcast on the internet, you're very welcome along to the show called Unbelievable. You're unbelievable. <laughs> Today on the programme, Victor Stenger joins me. He's an atheist, he's a US physicist, and he's the author of books such as God, the Failed Hypothesis. Uh, Last year he wrote The New Atheism, Taking a Stand for Science and Reason. Gives you an idea of where he's coming from on the whole question of God and science. In conversation with Victor today, Steve Fuller, Professor of Sociology and Philosophy of Science at Warwick University. Somewhat critical of the new wave of scientific atheism, and we'll be looking at his new book as well, Science in Acumen philosophy series the art of living so uh, we're going to have a fascinating discussion today as we ask is god a failed hypothesis and we're going to be looking at that from a philosophical point of view we'll hear why we might be looking at it from a slightly different point of view at the same time next week hope you enjoy the show as much as i will Well, it's great to have you both gentlemen on the show with me today. Uh, Let me first of all introduce Victor, who's new to the show. Um, Victor, uh, you're well known uh, among the atheist community uh, because you've written a number of books. And uh, you're you're quite open about your atheist beliefs and uh, or non-beliefs, depending on how you term it. (laughs) Um, But uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, Have you always sort of been an atheist as long as you can remember at least or uh, was well i was ra- actually raised as a catholic in bayonne new jersey in a working class neighborhood immigrant neighborhood uh where just about everybody was was catholic i hardly ever met a protestant and uh, there was some uh, jewish people of course but that was about it and uh, I, I certainly never heard anything except uh uh, the idea of god never heard never never heard any uh, atheist uh, talking about anything. I never read any atheist literature. Uh, but by the time I was a teenager and I had uh, uh, learned uh, about science, uh, I became con- pretty much convinced that the whole business was nonsense and uh, and took off from there. Now, I, I never, I wasn't an, an active uh, atheist all my life. In fact, when I went to UCLA to graduate school in physics, uh, I, I actually attended a nearby uh, uh, Methodist Church. To, uh, there was a large Methodist Church in, in Westwood, where the town where uh, UCLA is, and it had a great church choir, which I enjoyed singing in. And okay. it was a great place to meet girls. So uh, <laughs> uh, I, I went there for a while. I had some nice. Uh, it was a very liberal parish, it's, oh. uh, and uh, had, had some nice theological discussions with the pastors. Um. Obviously, you do wave the flag now, though, for, for atheism in a more sort of, you know, concentrated fashion. I mean, you, I understand you've mm. recently just been over in Copenhagen um, mm. talking to the, an atheist conference there. Yes, Tell there us about a, that. Yes, there was a uh, an atheist international uh, meeting in, in Copenhagen, went on for three days, had some terrific speakers, including Richard Dawkins uh, and um, uh, I, I was actually the last the last speaker. And at the very last moment, I changed my talk. I was going to give a, a talk on the new atheism, which is my last book, and I decided to talk about my next book instead. <laughs> which give I, that a plug. Which I understand is going to be about fine-tuning arguments. Yes, it's called the fallacy of, of uh, fine-tuning. So, well, uh, and that, that went over pretty well. So, right, it was it was fun. Very interesting. Well, these are the kind of topics we love to discuss here on the program, anyway. So, mm-hmm. so you'll fit right in, Victor. I'm sure. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I would be interested to know what drives you to to write specifically against belief in God. What, I mean, plenty of scientists are happy, you know, may have mm-hmm. not not have belief in God, but they don't particularly parade it. They don't yeah. write books trying well, to I, show why uh, God is. You know, I, I wasn't uh, particularly anti-religious uh, for, for a long time. In fact, my uh, my uh, wife and I uh, hardly ever talked uh, about uh, religion and. Uh, because we didn't go to church in our kids, so we had two children, and and we sent them to private schools in in Hawaii. In fact, our daughter went to Punahou. She was just uh, two years behind Barack Obama, 
And these were both church-related schools. They had to go to chapels and so on. It didn't bother us. Uh, and, we, and we didn't tell them what to believe. They both turned out to be atheists as well. But toward about the 80s, I began reading about all the claims being made. It wasn't just in religion, but also in in fields like parapsychology, and where where people were making all kinds of claims uh, that science uh, supported uh, the belief in the supernatural. And I just knew that was wrong. And the more I read about it, the more angry I got, and the more the more interested I became in 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 uh, uh, and showing why why this wasn't uh, the science as I knew it. So, so you felt that was a, the the call to to take up a, a specific stand yes. It was basically that. a defense mm. of science. Mm. Actually, I, I really felt very, very uh, passionate about that. Well, our other guest on the program today is Steve Fuller. <clears throat> Steve's been on the program a couple of times before, um, particularly in regard to when we were doing those debates around that film, Expelled, uh, the pro intelligent design film, Expelled. Um, but Steve, you're back again. Thanks for for coming over. Um, Thank you. Y- you're, you're an interesting character to me because uh, you're kind of somewhat anti-establishment, uh, a bit of a maverick, as many would say, because you essentially, um, you know, are in the pro-intelligent design camp, scientifically speaking. But we're not specifically talking about intelligent design today. We're, we're really focusing more on the whole, you know, whether whether science has consigned God to the dustbin, whether mm-hmm. um, we can treat God as a, a hypothesis to be tested and to yeah. be refuted, uh, which is essentially uh, what Victor Victor's line is. Um, what what's your response to the kind of new atheism, the new wave of scientific atheism that, that Victor represents? Well, the first thing I would say is, uh, in a sense, Victor and I are coming at this question, you might say, from opposite angles, um, because Victor is trying to show that science does not prove God's existence. Um, I'm doing the opposite. I basically think that you need God to prove science. Okay, so that's a, that's kind of a bit, and so the, the book that we're talking about, as far as I'm concerned, my book, The uh, Science, is about the art of living, and that is to say, uh, in what respect uh, is science something that one can take on as a comprehensive worldview, given the way in which science has, in fact, developed in the West. And, and for me, that's the crucial issue. Uh, the character that science has, which is this kind of uh, all-encompassing, unifying, rational understanding of the universe, which turns out to be quite counterintuitive, but nevertheless intelligible. Uh, and that's a very peculiar way of going about understanding nature. It's very distinctive to uh, the uh, the fields of inquiry that have come out of the Abrahamic traditions. And so here I think I should say, you know, that when I'm talking about the, the sort of God that's necessary for doing science... I am talking about um, the God in whose image and likeness we were created. So I focus on the Abrahamic religions as a whole, you might say, because they share that kind of common belief. It's what makes them distinctive as a set of religions. Um, That discovery, you might say, that focal point about those religions that make them called monotheism is actually an invention of the Enlightenment. And that, in a way, captures a little bit of my maverick character, because uh, what I find very important about the history of Western theology, and in particular the rise of this idea of monotheism, um, has really nothing to do with uh, church partisanship. It has to do with something that, as it were, arises above that. It's what, as it were, the different denominations that have been the source of sources of all the religious wars that have sort of pockmarked Western history. What is it that they actually have in common that distinguishes them, let's say, from Hindus, Buddhists, Confucianists, Taoists, and as it were, all the other religious cosmologies that you find from the rest of the world? Because it's within the Abrahamic faiths that, in fact, you get the development of science. And this relates to the issue of atheism, okay? Because atheism is a very funny word in Western intellectual history. Uh, For the most part, um, until you get into, let's say, after Darwin, so let's say within the last 150 years, atheism was usually a swear word that you kind of used to describe somebody else. It was rarely something that one asserted as one's Mm. own belief, okay? Um, What, in fact, most atheists were... Uh, especially when they were accused of being atheism, uh, was that they didn't go; they were not churchgoers, or they did not follow the orthodoxies of the particular faiths they were born into, and that's fine. 
And if that's all you mean by atheism, then yes, science is full of atheists in that sense historically. But that doesn't mean they didn't believe in God. That didn't. That doesn't mean they didn't read the Bible. That doesn't mean that their science wasn't integrally connected together with their religious beliefs. It just may, means that they were heterodox, mm. and often they had to suppress those beliefs. And 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 there's lots of stories that can be told about that with various figures. I but mean, it, in your book, you you make the distinction between atheism with a small a and atheism with a capital. Exactly. And that's a very important point, because the atheism with the small a is the atheism I've been talking about so far, which is just the denial of of church-based faith, you know, sort of the heterodox view toward God. That in a sense, if you take seriously the idea that we're creating the image and likeness of God, as a lot of people in the scientific revolution did, they believed that they could personally interpret the Bible and on the basis of that, use it to sort of develop scientific ideas that may, in, in, in the end, undermine the church's from which they came. So is is atheism with a capital A a somewhat more recent development? In yes, your I, I would say so. And this is where we get to issues of the new atheism and so forth. Uh, and that's the idea that um, God doesn't exist, that there's a, some, as it were, that this is the, the view in question that one's talking about, not that one is uh, anti-clerical, uh, but rather that a God does not exist. And this is the thing that is very much put forward now. And, and I think, you know, Victor's book in this respect is very much in the spirit of the mm. times, right? Mm. Um, and that's a relatively recent phenomenon. I mean, even within the culture of atheism in the United States, I think it's it's very interesting, and I talk a little bit about this in the book, that um, – if you look at the triumphs that atheism has had in the legal system in the United States up to about the 1980s, and you ask and, and you think about what would be the role of atheism in American culture, it was primarily in the moral and ethical sphere. In other words, if you were called, you know, if you were someone who stood up for atheism in the early 20th century, up to about 1980, I would say, um, you were kind of a libertarian with regard to morals. And and the, and the problem that you had with religion was, you know, that it was uh, sexually restrictive, right, and restrictive in all kinds of other ways. People didn't have the right to free choice and stuff like this. Um, but then you do get this sea change that takes place with a lot of the creationist trials and things like that in the 1980s. And then atheism starts to become this thing that gets identified very explicitly with science uh, in, in a way that was kind of a little fuzzier beforehand. Mm, mm. And, and now I think atheism as a kind of, quote, positive belief is very much presenting itself as the pro-science party. Well, um, if you're listening and you'd like to get in touch with us uh, about anything you hear on the program today, I welcome your emails in response to the subject we're discussing today. Perhaps uh, you already want to bang one out. Well, if you do, unbelievable at premier.org.uk is the place to send those emails, and I'm happy to read them out and indeed forward on any relevant ones to my guests on the program today. Um, and we'll be hearing some of your responses to, to previous editions of the program, as I said, later on in the show. Uh, if you uh, want to phone your response in, leave me a voicemail message. That's also an option. You can do that at 08456 52 52 52. Select option eight. And don't forget this program available as of now as a podcast at the show page, premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Um, I was trying to find a way to sum up perhaps what your point of view is on, on God, um, Vic, Victor. And, and First, uh, if, if you'll allow me, I'd like to uh, respond to a couple of things Go that ahead. Steve, let's, let's that jump Steve right said. Be, uh, I mean, in particular, the, the notion that, that uh, science grew out of, uh, of Christianity or out of, out of uh, the um, Abrahamic faiths, Abrahamic faiths mm. is, I think is rather ridiculous because, after all, we had we had the Greeks had science uh, uh, a thousand years before Augustine, and uh, in in fact, in I, I kind of date the beginning of science to to uh, uh, March twenty eighth, five hundred and eighty five BCE, when Thales that was of when Miletus the world was created. <laughs> <laughs> when, when Thales of Miletus uh, predicted the eclipse, an eclipse of the sun that ended a war. Uh, and that was kind of the first time, uh, at least historically, that there was an actual application uh, of, of of science, not just to build something like a pyramid, but to actually uh, uh, use use something very fundamental about the heavens to to make a prediction. And so that uh, 
that was the beginning of science. And, and if I could continue, if you look at history, remember, I'm, I'm just a scientist that looks at the data, all right? I, I, uh, and the data are pretty clear to me that... Uh, it, it, that science would we would be we would have been a thousand years ahead of where we are now if, if Christianity hadn't intervened. That, with that's the, with interesting. The dark ages. That, that's an interesting point of view. I mean, also maybe to sum up your view, I, I read um, in, in, on a website sort of a, an encapsulation of where you stand on the issue, aside from where science has come from. But that today, not only does the universe show no evidence for God, it looks exactly as it would ex- be expected to look if there yes. is no God. Yes. So, so, so from both the point of view of where science has come from and what it shows us today, you'd say. God should never have been in the picture to start with, and certainly is. Well, in the I picture. mean, I, I claim not only that is there is no evidence for God. We now have reached the point where where we uh, we can say beyond a reasonable doubt that there is evidence that God does not exist. That and that's that's the well, position. There's, there's, that's the position I took in my book, God the Failed Hypothesis. There, there's two things then, in, in a sense, coming out there, which is your claim, firstly, Steve, that science is in some way reliant on. A, 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 a view yes. of God to, to actually do its inquiry in the first place. You, this is something you support very strongly in all your books. You've, you've made this point again and again that we can only do science the way we've done it because we've had a certain world view, a certain view of the cosmos and a certain view of God. Um, but then we've also got this issue of, of whether science itself kind of has disproved God anyway, um, whether or not it came from a, a kind of world view like that. Well, what's your response then, obviously, to, to this first issue? that Okay, Victor well... Says? I think the key thing here is that um, if we do history in retrospect, that is to say, look for um, look for uh, precedents in the past of our own culture and, of course, other cultures, it is quite easy to find scientific ideas. You know, uh, Thales and the ancient Greeks, even in, you know, of course, China, India. There's no doubt that there are all these ideas, and that there are even theories, and for limited periods of time, even research programs. Um, what you don't and but in most of those cases, first of all, the science was subservient to statecraft, and in fact, the example Victor gave was of exactly of this kind right that in a sense, the reason why people were doing science was it was not a pursuit for its own sake to understand the ultimate nature of reality, that being seen as a kind of intrinsic good and ennobling feature of humanity. No, it was because this was very important for as it were administering your society and that you wanted people working on this, and so typically science was very closely connected with technology in all these places where these scientific ideas originally rose That's not true at all I mean when I was talking about Thales, Thales was talking about the nature of of, of the universe being water, uh, you had, sure. But you look had, at the context uh, you, you gave had the for at- it. Atomists who were, who were discussing about the very nature of matter that had nothing to do with statecraft. That well, was, that was they were talking about the the na- very nature of the universe right from the beginning. There. Well, yes, but the point is and actually it wasn't until pe- Christianity came along that people started started forgetting about important issues no, because no. they were so bound Look, there are, other, there are other things besides the statecraft issue, which actually is there with all those ancient Greek guys you're talking about, not least Plato and Aristotle. Um, and, and the other issue that involved is the idea that science is an intergenerational project, okay? That is to say, it is not something that you can just do in one lifetime, as it were, if you have enough leisure, which was typically kind of the Greek b- view on this. And it's quite explicit in people like Plato and Aristotle. Uh, and, it, and in fact, if you take those guys seriously, there's a sense in which you could do, you know, as it were, you could do whatever science needs to be done in your lifetime. And as it were, each individual lifetime, as it were, reinvents science for itself as part of a general kind of, uh, you might say, a sort of uh, intellectual therapy almost, okay, uh, which is quite different from the kind of conception that we have of science that, that in a sense is very much parasitic on the Christian salvation story, namely that there is this ultimate end, this you know grand unified theory of everything, where we, as it were, reunite with the mind of God, and it's going to take a long time to get there. We go from generation to generation. We're going to make a lot of errors along the way, but it's nevertheless still worth pursuing, and that along the way we're going to come up with things that we hadn't uh, thought of that is not commonsensical and really takes us away from our natural I, moorings. I know you well, want to respond to quite, that, Victor. It's quite the contrary. Can I, can I, can yeah, I, can I, can mean, I, can I put to you also... We are, we are so opposite on this that I think we're irre- <laughs> irreconcilable. So well, we well, might as well. I, that's why we're here. I, I, was, I wasn't expecting to reconcile. <laughs> because, because, because if anything, Christian Christianity and religion is a, is a hinder to progress. If once you... Put God Our into... notion of progress comes from it. That's no, the point. No, it doesn't. There's no progress in Christianity. There's no progress in religion. 
things have to stay the same once once you allow uh, progress into the into the story. Uh, you allow a changes to take place. So you no longer have, you no longer have a. a, a the but but is in isn't 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 Steve's point more what what the framework within which we do science? I mean, to quote from from your book here, Steve, you you talk actually about your very area, Victor, which is physics, and you talk about physicists. You say. Alongside Newton, we could place Roger Bosovich, Michael Faraday, Lord Kelvin, James Clerk Maxwell and Ludwig Boltzmann, all of whom saw the hand of God in the counterintuitive, if not downright supernatural, remote control properties associated with what we now recognize as electromagnetic fields. You, you, you suggest that th- th- these people's understanding that they, this could be grasped well, was, was, all, was based couldn't... in their understanding that there was a system within which they were yes. working, which made well, it. They, That's could, right. they couldn't be anything but religious because if they weren't, they would, they would have had their heads... Uh, hand it to them. Uh, so, so, uh, <laughs> Steve, and it Steve. is also true. I should say that it is also true that there were good scientific arguments for, for the existence of God up until recent times. But now I think most of those arguments, in fact, all of those arguments, can be sufficiently uh, countered. Uh, arguments from design, for example, uh, they, they were good arguments. But are you suggesting uh, now, that none of those we... people had that their faith made no difference to them in their pursuit of the science that they did? Because from what they've actually written, that's they blatantly contradict oh, that. Many of them. I don't think so. I think if you look at uh, what uh, uh, Newton wrote, uh, he was quite uh, more of a deist uh, than a theist. He, 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 even though he held the chair in Trinity College, he didn't believe in the Trinity. He. Uh, uh, most of these these early yeah, but a deist uh, is not an atheist. But this case, is a very important point. In any case, we're not talking. I don't. Know, why, why do you want to talk about science by science four hundred years ago? Let's talk about it today. No, no. But I how, think how, that, how, no, how, no. How but it, can, let, can let's I just allow Steve to respond? Yeah, look, look. The the point here about all these guys that got mentioned here uh, is first of all, it's it's not that they were suppressing. Um, you know that, that that somehow they they were just as it were officially religious. In fact, if you look at their the religious views amongst these people, uh, they're quite new, nuanced, quite het, most most cases quite heterodox actually. And and actually, some of them did get a bit into trouble in their lifetime. Um, but it was very intimately related with the kind of science they were doing. I would say, in a sense, what marks them as scientists as opposed to theologians is basically the means by which they were trying to realize their understanding of God. So. Rather than spending most of their time, let's say, doing biblical exegesis, right, the understanding of God that they had in their relationship to God was being expressed through designing experiments in physics by doing mathematics, okay? And, and, and as it were, this is kind of – you, you get this kind of hybrid feel that all these people contributed to as well as Newton, uh, natural theology, Right, which is this point, which is very unpopular now, I know, in a lot of theological circles, but basically in a sense where you do science to discover God. Uh, and this, I think, has been a very powerful motivator well into the late 19th, early 20th century. But that's not the way history happened. I mean, you make up. You're, you're famous, incidentally, for, for making up history. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, yeah. Uh, Actually, uh, this is true, what I'm saying. I mean, for, for, uh, within a generation of, uh, of, of Newton, you had people like Laplace. You had the Enlightenment. I mean, the whole Enlightenment was the first time in history, probably, that people began, except maybe in, in ancient uh, India, where people began to uh, question the whole notion of God, the whole uh, What they questioned was the church God. authority, okay? In fact, what they were doing in the Enlightenment for the most part, this is where we get our notions of monotheism from. It was basically, as it were, separating the wheat from the chaff of religion. In other words, there was definitely, as you, you, know, as you have suggested, there was this view that a lot of religion was nothing but, quote, priestcraft. Right. So there was a very strong anti-clerical streak in the Enlightenment. There's no doubt about it. But that was being kept separate from very fundamental notions of, of the Abrahamic faiths, especially the idea that we are endowed with reason, God-given reason, which distinguishes us from other creatures, which is what enables us to understand the universe as well as we do. And they definitely wanted to preserve that. And that's why they were very cl- uh, sort of keen on not being atheists, but on being these kind of intermediate positions, deist being one of them, unitarian. There were all these kind of positions that were carved out during and what, the And what basis do you have to say that comes from the Abrahamic faith? Where, where is it in the Bible that They said it. I mean, the point is, if you they are the ones who invented the term yes, monotheism. Yes, but it was, if they happen 
happen to if they happen to be re- uh, religious at the time. Everybody was religious at the time. I don't, she, uh, they could have they there could have been no religion whatsoever at that time. A and lot they, of these guys these got guys into trouble have, for their would have done the beliefs. same thing. They, you would, they the same developments would have occurred is, had there been no no religion at all. I don't is, believe that. Is, for is, a your, is your is your point now that that I do. it's it's because of this the fact you see this trend of science emerging from these monotheistic specifically monotheistic religions in the world and not from other religious systems that you draw that, that yes that, i mean because uh, because he i mean contrary to what victor says in fact within the monotheistic faiths there is this strong tradition of eschatology which is to say that there is a kind of destiny to the human condition salvationism and what's common to all these stories which in in in, in the history of protestantism gets called providentialism is the idea that, that it's going to be a long hard trek to salvation that it's not going to happen overnight there's going to be a lot of obstacles in the way but nevertheless it is worth pursuing and and see, it's that kind of idea of thinking about the human condition as a kind of rationally organized intergenerational task. That is what science, as it were, picks up as its kind of institutional shell. Well, well, we, we're going to have to get, take a break. I'm sure, Victor, you'll want to respond again. But it, it would be interesting, in a sense, to move that discussion on to, to now. Victor mm-hmm. said, well, let's talk about science sure. now, not 400 years ago, and, sure. and why you would say that still Yes. resonates today and why Victor obviously feels that, that that's bunk um, and we'll, we'll get back to the discussion in just a short moment. Fascinating stuff I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, Victor Stenger, um, famed US physicist with me on the show today and indeed next week uh, I'll tell you shortly what he's doing next week here on the show um, but uh, looking both at Victor's uh, failed God hypothesis theory um, uh, and taken from the title of his book God the Failed Hypothesis alongside Steve Fuller's latest book uh, which is Science in Acumen's series, The Art of Living. So uh, you can find out more details about both of those with the podcast of this online at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. We're going to continue this uh, lively discussion today um, on the show in just a short moment's time after a quick break. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Well, we've had a ding-ding and a timeout from uh, this boxing match today. <laughs> but uh, no, in all seriousness, um, the, the, the views of my guests today radically differ. And so it's not surprising they've got uh, uh, you know, some passion in what they're saying. We're looking at the question today, is God a failed hypothesis, philosophically speaking? Next week, we're actually going to be asked that uh, from a statistical point of view, um, looking at the scientific data that uh, our guest today, Victor Stenger marshals in his book, God the Failed Hypothesis. Uh, That was a New York Times bestseller. And uh, he also wrote recently, The New Atheism, Taking a Stand for Science and Reason. Victor, um, uh, a much uh, lauded scientist. Uh, He's an emeritus professor of physics at the University of Hawaii, adjunct professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado, and probably many more titles beside. Uh, He's in conversation today with my other guest Steve Fuller who's a professor of sociology at Warwick University and uh, is somewhat considered a bit of a maverick in the way he approaches the whole debate Um, but he's very critical certainly of the new wave of scientific atheism of which Victor is a flag bearer. Uh, His new book Science in Acumen's philosophy series The Art of Living defends the, the, the idea that belief in God is fundamental to scientific inquiry and that's really where our conversation has been focused thus far. So, gentlemen, um, I was saying uh, we should probably move the ground slightly now. To we, We've talked about whether, you know, you, you both obviously disagree on whether there is a sort of Judeo-Christian basis on which science had to be fertilised, as it were. Um, but um, coming, as it were, to, to today, um, your, your feeling is whatever you believe about that, you can't possibly look at the scientific findings we have of today and still rationally hold to belief in God. And, and in a sense... What your book did, God the Failed Hypothesis, Victor, is very much treat God as a testable hypothesis and say, well, let's look at the data. Does it fit? No. Therefore, we flunked God on, on this. This. So, so, I mean, what what maybe give us a, 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 we can't go into great detail, but but mm-hmm. just some of the key things that for you made made that hypothesis um, void, as it were. Yes. Yes. The basic point, first of all, is that when, when I say we can demonstrate or even prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that God does not exist, I'm talking about the God most people worship, who is a God that 
you know, most uh, the Judeo-Christian, Islamic God, and possibly other religions as well, uh, uh, who plays such an important role in the universe, is so active in the universe, uh, is responsible for every leaf falling to the ground, is responsible for every uh, every atomic transition in every one of the billion galaxies uh, that a hundred billion galaxies that are within our horizon and the hundreds and hundreds of billions and billions of galaxies beyond our horizon, uh, that God also listens to every human thought and answers prayers and, uh, and, and talks to people and gives them information that they would not otherwise have known. All of that is testable. Okay. All of that is testable. And, and the tests all fail. There's no evidence that prayer works. There's no evidence that God uh, 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 talks to people. There, there's no sign of God in the cosmos. There's no reason to introduce God to explain the uh, the creation of the universe. Uh, well, and so I, I know uh, that... we, have, we have scientific, uh, uh, plausible scientific physics, cosmological explanations for all these phenomena. I mean, I know that next week we'll deal with this in a little bit more detail. Uh, you're going to be speaking to David Bartholomew, who contests this idea that you can treat God in that way, it sort of put him in, you know, test you in that sense. Yes, actually, and, and, I'm, I'm very familiar with Bartholomew's book, and I, I, I discussed it with some, with some uh, uh, you know, uh, fellow atheists <laughs> recently. No, no, or, some... Uh, some uh, pleasure and, and okay. uh, acceptance in 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 my book uh, Quantum Gods. Ah, so uh, right, absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, it's great so that we'll that have you good. guys meeting yeah. next week, and, yes. and because he wants to take you up on this idea that you can you can test prayer in that way you can right. you can do these things um uh, because uh, he he obviously has a different view of things mm -hmm. as a statistician but um steve what what's your response to this kind of approach to 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 looking at god and uh, is is this the role of science is this what um is god a concept that you can do that to in that sense well i I guess let, let me start by saying I think it does matter what conception of God one thinks one's tackling, okay, because, uh, I mean, the way Victor described God, it was this kind of very vague thing that perhaps is what people pray to. But, in fact, the, the notion of God that was very instrumental and I think still provides a justification for continuing to do science is one where – which which implies that human beings have a special relationship to the deity such that we can potentially inhabit the mind of God and figure out the basis on which the entire universe is created. So that would justify, for example, a lot of the value preferences that we have within science. So the idea that you can explain the most by the least, right? Those sorts of principles of simplicity, right? The idea that there's kind of unity to nature. Those are not trivial assumptions, and they're not assumptions that are made by all cultures either. And there's, and, but nevertheless, they are very much part of the fundamentals of science, and it has a lot to do with the fact that historically we have been imagining and, you know, that in a sense what we're trying to do is figure out the plan, okay? And that the plan is something that is within our reach to understand because we have a special relationship with the designer. Now, if you take that off the table, if you think that you in some sense have falsified the God hypothesis, the question that you immediately have to ask is, why continue doing science in the way we've been doing it? Well, why is that? I mean, why, why do you have to... Why, why is God so necessary, though? Why, why can't it just be a blank fact of life that we, we are... We have discovered a set of principles which seem to be drawing us towards this idea that there is a grand unified theory and that is the goal of, of the science area. works works it's the, the, a, it's the a the process that works, works. The, this is the and problem so you, do, you really don't want to use that criteria this is the problem you think this is a great criteria but then you have to look at the costs as well as the benefits yes science works it works to build bombs Mm -hmm. OK, uh, for every scientific discovery you make that has some benefits, not only theoretically, but also practically, there are loads that are negative. And if you did a real balance sheet about science and if you were judging science purely as a balance sheet idea, there would be an open question about whether we should have been pursuing science all along. It's only if you think there's some ultimate payoff down the road that it's worth going through all the trouble, all the wars, all the destruction that science has, in fact, been responsible for. And I'm not saying this is someone who's anti-science. I'm being kind of real politique about this, that if you're going to put, as it were, the benefits of science on the table, well, then make sure you put the costs on the table, too. Yes, but they are, the benefits so far exceed the costs. Is uh, that, it's not uh, so obvious. I mean, I really don't, if you really, you really feel, don't want to go really down feel that, that way, 
if you really feel that way, why are you here on the radio? Ex- why aren't Why aren't you sending out smoke signals? Actually, yeah. I do agree that sign. I do agree, but it's not because I do a cost benefit analysis of it. It's because I have faith that ultimately we are actually going to be able to figure out the fundamental principles of the universe. Okay, mm-hmm. and in that respect, science is going to cash out the promise of theology. But if I were the sort of person who judged science purely on a cost benefit basis, I'd start asking a lot of questions, and I would cut certain kinds of funding immediately. I mean, well, you, sure, sure. You can do that. You can ask questions. You, you have every right to do that. I mean, and I think... Nuclear I think, energy, genetics, all of that would go if you look at the destruction it's caused. Well, we, we don't know yet uh, we, we do know about that, nuclear actually. energy. We, we do know, actually know that. We know that we may have to rely on nuclear energy whether we like it or not. But that's that's these are all issues certainly to be argued I'm just to saying we do not about. want to use a cost-benefit analysis to but judge But I, I, I claim that science is... Uh, 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 does not today scientists do not think in terms of of uh, some ultimate reality they just uh, well, then, and that's I, I've worked with science I, I, I did science for 40 years I did I research for 40 years Look, I and let me tell you uh, a research scientist gets 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 involved with his project and and uh, is interested in gathering data and and, and why should the checking. public fund it uh, Why should the public fund it? Because science has proved to be very useful. Where would you be without electricity? Again, you, if you, Again, put the, if if you, you do you, a cost-benefit thing, get, it goes both ways. Are you, do you, would you like to have your tooth pulled by a barber? Come on. There's so, yes, but so I, much, t- I like taking risks. Every, you ask any citizen today. You take a poll of citizens today and, they, and ask them whether they would rather be with or without science, and you know what the answer would be. Yes, but the issue is why, right? What makes it rational to do this? Because it works. It's a procedure but that works. But works cuts both ways. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can see w- w- there's obviously um, you're not going to agree on this. Uh, in some sense, though, many people might ask, Victor, as, as you study physics and look, you know, if, if the object of physics is this grand unified theory of everything, um, you could easily... Incidentally, I don't think it is necessarily. It, that, that, but yeah. well, well, then why do it? But, but, but in a sense, you do it. You do it because you you have curiosity and you want to learn and you want to. Uh, I mean, uh, isn't this advance. one of the points that that, that that Steve is making though? Is that this 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 if you like almost it, it has no evolutionary advantage to us to have this inquiry, this sense of wanting to know just because it's good to know not because it necessarily even has an advantage we don't need, to us. i mean i think we i think human the uh, human race has pretty much stopped evolve, evolving so <laughs> we don't need an evolutionary reason for uh, uh for something we've gone beyond evolutionary reasons we 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 want to uh uh, uh learn how to think what kind of a think. darwinist are you then <laughs> <laughs> well i'm a darwinist with respect to biology uh, and uh, but, but you think biology we've, operates on a uh, we've transcend- on a, an enormous time scale, and and uh, we've only been around 150 to 100,000 years. I have enough time for for uh, evolution to make much difference. Hey, so wait, feel- wait till we get enough nuclear radiation, <laughs> well, uh, genetic uh, mutation like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, um, I'm, I suppose one of the questions I want to ask you as well is um, one of the the chapters of Steve's book is what has atheism ever done for science? Mm -hmm. I mean, Steve's contention is that far from being this block on science, Christianity has been this force which has fertilized the scientific inquiry that you talk of. And he's suggesting, actually, that things like... um, Well, one of the interesting things you say in your book, Steve, is that had, if you like, Darwin come before Newton, we would have had a much impoverished sense of scientific inquiry because whereas Newton bequeathed, well I'll quote for what you say, you say um, uh, when Huxley talked about this himself actually who was obviously a great supporter of Darwin um, you say Huxley's, Huxley's point was that had Darwin preceded Newton Newton would have been bequeathed with a downscaled sense of human aspiration as just one among many animal species destined for extinction. He would have had no basis for believing that he could think his way out of his material mo- moorings. I, I, I just don't see why Newton wouldn't have been still Newton he he uh, he was another scientist, like so many research scientists uh, that I've met, who who uh, was carried away with his own work in his laboratory and and uh, was was uh, motivated by curiosity about the, about 
uh, how the world worked. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but Newton's and, doing uh, you more don't than know. just you have focus no on a laboratory, right? In fact, yeah. the, the lab part of Newton's work is probably, in a way, you know, kind of the, the tail of the dog, right? I mean, Newton was very concerned with having a kind of mathematically unified picture of nature, which under one set of laws put together terrestrial and, celest- and celestial motions, which to the naked eye look radically different from each other. But nevertheless, he somehow believed, and why did he believe this, that somehow there was a unified mathematical picture? Well, okay. it was because he thought he was getting in the mind of God. But if you've got Darwin coming first, and you know, and Darwin basically saying our knowledge is for purposes of adapting to our environment and is primarily sensorily based, you will never have any kind of incentive to think that, as it were, parts of the world that behave radically differently should be thought about together as part of one unified system. Well, look, I mean, 7%, only 7% of the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S., the elite group of scientists in the U.S., uh, believe in a personal God. So they obviously don't have such a motivation. Most scientists don't have such a motivation. In fact, the scientists that I know who are believers are all people who pretty much uh, have two different parts of their brains. They have one part of their brain that uh, is their religion and another part that's their science, and the two of them never mix. They put the science aside when they go into the church the, the church on uh, on, you know, on I have Sunday, actually said this and, as a and joke. They, <laughs> and they, and, and uh, it's not a joke. It's a fact. I know. Not... You, you take it seriously. It's a joke, though. It really is. Well, I'd love to see the brain scientists come up with this hemispheric <laughs> differentiation of science and religion. Well, <laughs> I, I, I mean, obviously you feel then that the science – Religion, if people have religious beliefs, they, they are purely coincidental to their scientific um, you know, understanding and their, their scientific approach. I mean, well, antithetical to it. Uh, they I mean, obviously sense, have to shut their science in, in sense, down to, uh, to believe. What, what, what Steve's proposing, though, is that whether they realize it or not, they are dependent on a Judeo-Christian understanding, um, which they, their science was birthed mm-hmm. in, to, to, to give. Now, the question, though, I want to look at right now is... Is you know, Steve, respond to to this this quote from Victor that um, we have that not only does the universe show no evidence for God, it looks exactly as it would be expected to look if there is no God. I mean, is do you think Victor is in the position to be able to make the judgment of what the universe should look like in the first place if if there were a God behind behind it? Well, I mean, that's an interesting question too. I mean, I I, I guess I would my response to this would be um, then. Well, first of all, is this uh, the, the the spirit of the common? Is it meant just to, as it were, allow the possibility that that the way we understand the physical universe is compatible with atheism? Which, in a sense, I have no disagreement with. I think the question comes with motivating the scientific enterprise once you take atheism really seriously. That's the, the, where I would come in and say, "Okay, Victor, let's grant you your point. Now, why do we do science?" Okay, and, you know, and- so the point. I'll give you a, a, a real concrete example of this because Victor has been talking about how working scientists uh, don't need to believe in God, and, and if they do, they put it on one half of their brain. Um, if you look at somebody like Steven Weinberg, for example, who's very much uh, responsible for trying to unify the laws of nature, Nobel Prize winner, also a very important popular science writer. Um, And he is a professional atheist, you might say, and in fact, one of the darlings of the new atheist crowd. Um, I think one of the things that's very striking if you read his works um, is he has a really hard time justifying the kind of science that he does, which is the kind of science I'm talking about, in anything other than what I think would be regarded as subjective terms. In other words, there's a kind of a a beauty to the aesthetics of having simple unified laws. Uh, You know, there's this curiosity argument that gets trotted out, right? There are all these sorts of arguments. And, And while I'm sure they're quite persuasive to Weinberg, there is a question as to why is knowledge produced out of those motives something that everyone should have an interest in? Why should be setting the gold standard for knowledge in general, right? Uh, and and uh, why should we be paying it so much attention rather than just treating it as a kind of elite hobby for very smart people? And I well, think that's kind of the problem that you end up with uh, if you really take God off the table, is that in a sense you can justify continuing to do science – in, in, in the sort of Newton-Einstein way, as Weinberg does, but it becomes justifiable only as an elite hobby. It doesn't become justifiable as a form of knowledge that we should make the gold standard of all, of all the knowledge we have and somehow think of it as the vanguard of our, our, of our becoming, you know, what human beings are meant to be. Well, that's true that, the, that uh, uh, physicists such as Weinberg uh, are 
are what might be called Platonists. Namely, they do believe that there, there's uh, that their science is, is leading to some knowledge of of a reality out there. Roger Penrose believes this. Is a many, that's a very wide belief among theoretical physicists and almost all mathematicians. But it is not a wide belief among experimental physicists like myself. Our attitude is that all we know is what we observe. We have no other. We uh, uh, we have no other way of knowing about about nature. So we ha- we observe the world and then we build models and in these models we invent terms like space and time. Those are human inventions. We- whether or not space and time have anything to do with reality, we have no way of knowing, we have no way of ever knowing. And and so we build these models and these models are then used uh, to uh, compare with data. If they don't agree with the data, we toss the model out. So the model has to have some connection with reality. I agree to that. But what that connection is, we don't know. We have no way of knowing. We'll never know. And furthermore, uh, we don't need to know because all, all these theories do for us, all these models do for us, is enable us to make predictions about other observations. And we had, tells us nothing about what's beyond. I mean, I have heard it said, and, and maybe you can set me right on this, but... Well, I often think of it this way, at least. Um, you have a, a biologist like Richard Dawkins, and, and you can maybe understand his natural bent towards atheism because he's looking at a process which is, um, you know, which, which he has deduced is completely, there, there's no outside effect on it. It's just a, a law that, that exists in and of itself. But then I look at physicists and, and I think, well, surely physicists have a bit more reason for believing in an ultimate cause, a god or whatever, because you work in this framework of this immense mathematical symmetry and beauty that seems to exist independent mm-hmm. of you. Now, you've said these models are models we invent, but they're, they're models that we have put onto the physical properties we exactly. observe in the world. And, and, in fact, the, the, and, and yeah. surely, doesn't, doesn't it sort of almost cry out for some kind of explanation? Why, why should everything be so utterly intelligible and we mere mortals are able to uh, you know find out the complexities of our universe yeah, why do the models work why right? do the, why do that's the models the, work yeah what, that's and, the kind of working it, it that's feels relevant. to me like that needs why does that re- require that why does that require any kind of power are you, are you saying that's just a brute uh, fact that, that this incredible we have, no, we have is, no way of knowing we have no way of knowing and they don't and, and they don't tell us anything they don't tell us anything about uh, about reality it, it it seems to me though that and i perhaps this is where my my bias towards steve's view comes in that yeah. aren't, isn't that just kind of putting a, a, a blank against a huge question that needs asking no because is, we can answer when the things question. look like we have, they were set up <laughs> no but we, have, where did it come we can from? explain we can explain how the universe came about from nothing Consistent with all all we know, we can explain how the laws of physics came about from nothing. Can we? we yes, I, we can. Uh, last yes, I heard, can. that was still a major debate. I have debate. a book called the Unconscious Quantum. I'm sorry, no, uh, that was another book. I, the uh, the Comprehensible Cosmos, where where I work this out, I show you how from from just one simple principle, uh, and that is that. Uh, when we are making our models, these models can't depend on any particular point of view. From that, you can get the the, the laws of physics, and so you you don't need. And there there are scenarios that you could work out perfectly mathematically for how the universe uh, uh, tunneled by uh, from a from a previous universe uh, or from a state of chaos. Uh, you can argue that the that's quantum tunnel, the well-known uh, quantum process that's been known for 50 years. You have a mechanism by which the universe can come from nothing. We have many. We have a complete uh, scenario that we can we can draw to to show how uh, it's quite natural for nothing to to have. Uh, uh, produced everything. Produced something, yes. Okay. Um, that That's a new one on me because obviously I haven't read the book, that particular book. So, so uh, but, but Steve, what's your reaction to that concept, which, which at its basis says, however you arrive at it, that s- something does come from nothing and we can show that scientifically? Well, if we're talking about something that is like the Big Bang, that was an idea that was in fact originally invented to explain how God created Okay, I mean, if we're talking this uh, this Belgian Jesuit, uh, Le not a, not and not he was a he was a Jesuit priest. He was a a brilliant scientist. 
and he came he came up with the big bang to explain the data not not to That's not it. and when and when uh, the pope said oh now you have found proof of the existence of god he warned the pope not to say that because it was a preliminary <laughs> scientific idea and the pope should in particular be very careful uh, uh, about claiming uh, uh, his, uh, I am making the argument. I'm not. I'm not making to prove the existence of God with this, but rather that the that the motivation to lead him to interpret the data in that way was the idea of creation ex nihilo, if which he, is very if, much a biblical. If doctrine. he had been an atheist, he would have done it as well. I have no reason to believe that. <laughs> well, uh, he well, was motivated ma- ma- maybe by... he would have, but we, it still leads us to ask the question: Are I mean, we are we kind of forbidden from asking? Well, what? caused that or is that just a, a, a question that doesn't make sense to you or is just I mean atheists come up with ideas all the time I mean <laughs> and in fact most since most scientists are atheists every every idea that's come that's uh, again, been you've got to be introduced. careful what you mean by atheist here <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm sure most of them don't go to church every Sunday. No, they they don't believe in any any uh, uh, supreme being. That's what I mean. I, I mean, I have heard it said though, Victor, that um, atheists they also uh, believe just in a material universe and a- nothing else. A- atheists who believe in a material universe are, are desperate to avoid any conclusion that there might be something supernatural behind the the Big no, Bang, it's not and therefore and therefore theories of multiverses. Absolutely and everything not. Absolutely else. not. The scientists are not desperate to uh, discover something new. They would love to discover something new. If a scientist found evidence for the supernatural, they would jump at the opportunity. But, but inevitably, we, we've re- reached the level of, you know, um, metaphysics at the point where we, we, we stop talking about what we can observe and we, we're talking about multiverses and things like that. What, what, what makes my belief that there is a, a God who put things into motion and your belief that perhaps there was a multiverse or something, neither of us have any more evidence than the other. Oh, yeah, because uh, one one does not require uh, a preposterous claim. Which one and is that? The, <laughs> which which the one preposterous is preposterous claim that 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 there's some superpower out there uh, why, beyond why matter is that, that, that is controlling to... everything that happens. In, you don't know how vast the universe is. You not well, just not God just does. the part, <laughs> that, not just the part that we see but i mean but, that, isn't that the whole point of god that that god god is big enough for the vastness of the universe i mean i i don't have a problem I, obviously i don't know how big the universe is but but i the point is yeah as Steve says I, i'm assuming but god anyway does. it doesn't matter there's no basis for it <laughs> well, there's can, no can reason ask, there's no reason for god go ahead What's i would ask you just to get a get a clear sense of where you do stand on issues re- regarding the supernatural and the paranormal and so forth um I know you believe that there's no experimental evidence for this. I understand that. Um, but do you believe experimental that... Experimental evidence against it. I, right. I go further. Yes, okay, fair enough. The question I have for you is whether you believe that there should that research should be funded to inquire into it. Sure, sure. Okay. It depends on how much. Now, I think, I think after 150 years uh, of, of research, uh, ESP could be forgotten about, uh, extrasensory perception and some of the paranormal phenomena. Uh, but that doesn't mean, for example, that we can can't continue to study the possibility of the efficacy of prayer, because it's only recently that there have been some good experiments uh, on that subject, and and uh, by Duke and and Harvard and Mayo Clinic, they've all come up negative, and I don't say that's the final answer. So far, it's negative, but that kind of work uh, uh, could certainly go on. There's still claims that. Uh, that you hear from Duke University, from Harold Koenig, that uh, that religion is is good for you health wise. I think that's quite questionable. Those conclusions, are because there are other indications that it's bad for you, and so that kind, those kinds of studies, uh, studies involving religion, certainly should go ahead. I, absolutely. Um, we're going to have to take another break here. Uh, interesting, you mentioned that that study on prayer, etc., that you look at in things like uh, God the Failed Hypothesis, because that that will be part of what we're looking at next week um, in our program when David Bartholomew joins us. So I'll tell you a bit more about that on the other side of a short break. You're listening to Unbelievable, the show that gets you thinking about faith uh, from lots of different perspectives. My guests in the studio today are Steve Fuller, professor of sociology at Warwick University. His latest book, and you can find it with uh, on the web page and with this podcast at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. His latest book is Science 
and that's part of Acumen's philosophy series, The Art of Living. If you want to find out more about the way Steve views these topics, uh, a, g- a good book worth reading. And also, uh, well, if you haven't already bought it, uh, it's a New York Times bestseller, God, the Failed Hypothesis by Victor Stenger, uh, to see uh, how uh, Victor outlines his case against God as a scientific hypothesis. So um, those are the guests, those are the books, and we'll be back in a short moment for our guests to uh, wrap up this discussion on today's programme. Well, thank you for choosing Premier Christian Radio this afternoon. You're listening to Unbelievable. Don't forget, later on this afternoon, you can hear Hip Rock UK, the very best in contemporary young Christian music. Uh, That's between four and six o'clock this afternoon. And uh, Loretta Fenton presents after that with the best of unsigned Christian talent in the UK. Uh, But if you're listening, uh, you may well be listening online. Uh, And if you are, you can find this show to listen back to again at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. Lots of people download the podcast and uh, interact with the forums at the Premier community. So premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable for those sorts of things. Thanks to everyone, by the way, who has donated to our Igniting the Faith appeal, supporting the ongoing work of Premier, uh, both the radio station and our internet, TV and magazine arms. Uh, So thank you for all those who have done that in the past week. And still not too late to do that uh, by visiting the website premier.org.uk. Well, next week on the show, we ask, can you conduct an experiment to see if God exists? Effectively, that's what God the Failed Hypothesis claims you can do. Victor Stenger joins us again as he's in conversation with Christian David Bartholomew. David's area of expertise is statistics. And he says that Victor has used them in a, a false way in his book, uh, in the way he tries to uh, show that God does not exist. Um, So we'll find out why David objects to things like these studies to show whether or not prayer works and whether therefore there is a God and why he says you simply can't use statistics in the same way when you put God into the equation. Okay, uh, that's to come next week at the same time. Uh, God is God a failed hypothesis uh, and we're looking at it from a statistical perspective. Right now, let's get back to today's discussion. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. It's uh, the time of the week on Premier when we get the grey cells working extra hard. uh, And we've had two very um, uh, astute people in the studio joining me today. Uh, Really know their stuff. Victor Stenger is uh, an atheist US physicist and the author of the New York Times bestselling God the Failed Hypothesis, among many other books. And uh, he's over in the the UK for a short time, so I've grabbed him uh, as he's over here to to do debate with a couple of people. And uh, Steve Fuller today has been interacting with Victor on this whole question of whether God is a failed hypothesis and the philosophical foundations for the, the very act of scientific inquiry. Steve you've been suggesting throughout this program that um, it's kind of makes a mockery of the whole process if you take God out of it. Um, I mean, one of the chapters and one of the most pertinent chapters in your book that we've been looking at is is actually titled What Has Atheism Ever Done for Science? Um, Is it your contention then, in all honesty, that that if, if, as it were, the, the history of the world had been different and that Victor's worldview had been established you know, from that early point in time, that uh, we really would have not had the scientific progress we've had, that, that really the atheism is actually a blockage, just as Victor views views Christianity as a blockage uh, it's a scientific progress. You, you, you equally view atheism as a blockage. Yes, I think if, uh, if Victor's view were around uh, at the beginning, uh, you might say, of science, uh, that what we would have, I think, are, I think, sophisticated forms of knowledge that, uh, as it were, enable us to adapt well to the kinds of worlds that we live in. Um, If there would be any kind of interest in finding out a sort of comprehensive, unified understanding of the universe, I think that would be treated as kind of an elite hobby that perhaps, you know, kind of maybe on the order of chess, but it wouldn't have the kind of significance as a form of knowledge that it has come to have in the modern times because in order for that to be the case, uh, that kind of knowledge of a unified understanding of nature has to be seen as reflecting some kind of special relationship that we have to nature, that it is intelligible. And in order for that understanding of intelligibility uh, to be cashed out, Historically, the effective way, and I think this is where the necessary condition of God comes in, is that we, in some sense, were created in God's image and likeness, and that enables us to have the confidence 
to be able to have a unified understanding of reality of the sort that physics, in particular, Victor's own field, has excelled at doing. And just to to kind of also give the other side of that, um, when it comes to modern scientific inquiry and discoveries, do you feel that the, the modern advance of physics, for example, has actually left us with more cause to believe in God in that sense because of the, the complexity that we were discussing that it's shown earlier? I mean, or, or is this just, you know, you with your old God of the gaps kind of argument? No, no. I mean, I mean, I think the interesting thing about the history of physics uh, is that the kind of general unified view that we seem to be working toward uh, removes us farther and farther away from our evolutionary origins in terms of the kinds of knowledge that's demanded of us. So whether we're talking about non-Euclidean geometry or causal indeterminacy, all these kind of crazy effects that physicists have come up with, especially in the 20th century, it is it is telling us basically that a unified understanding of, of reality is indeed possible, but it's on terms that's radically different from the kind of knowledge that's necessary for us to survive as animal beings. It really forces us, as it were, to raise our game in terms of a form of knowledge. And, in, and I think that's evidence for saying, at least I think it can be used as evidence for saying that we are getting to a kind of higher, more transcendent form of knowledge that people who have aspired to know God were aiming at. Okay. Victor. Well, first of all, I'd like to answer the question, what has atheists uh, done for, uh, for science? What has atheism done for science? I think it's, it's helped a lot of scientists uh, from being burned at the stake, for one thing. Uh, I think that, uh, you, I mean, Steve Scott an interesting speculation, but he has absolutely no basis for it because it doesn't agree with observations. It doesn't agree with the facts. The facts are that we had uh, uh, a science uh, 2,500 uh, years ago. Uh, we had science. We went through a period of dark ages where we lost it. And what was, what was the cause of the dark ages? Christianity. And then when Christianity finally began to be uh, uh, chipped away at in the Enlightenment, we, we got science back. And, and it's been in, improving ever since. And so those are the, those are the facts. The that scientific revolution happened 100 years before the Enlightenment, and they were basically Protestants, most of these people. Well, the Enlightenment was, was when it flowered, let me put it that way. And, and so in any case, there's, there's no reason to believe that that uh, religion uh, enhances progress. Uh, suppose we were to put God into our models, as they try to do it, for example, with the intelligent design uh, theory. You put, you put God in, then you have no reason to, to progress any further because once you, have, you, once you have in your chain of explanations, you say, that here, God stepped in, as in the famous cartoon, uh, uh, here's a miracle, then... You, you can't go any further. So if anything, any kind of religious involvement in the scientific process is, is bound to put a halt to it. So on, on, uh, instead of providing for progress, it does quite the opposite. It puts a halt to progress. And, and uh, as, as far as atheism, again, is concerned, uh, the great bulk of, uh, of scientists today are atheists, especially the uh, the premier scientists, people like Hawking and and and, we and uh, Weinberg, the people who've made the great contributions, are atheists. Uh, Einstein was an atheist. I mean, uh, you uh, you have to look at again, look at the facts. Forget about uh, some crazy theory. Uh, <laughs> well, well, that, that doesn't have any connection with reality. It's all made up. Uh, uh, look at what the data say. Well, we, we, we're, we're, we're kind of almost out of time. Um, I feel I should let you respond to the accusation of your crazy theory before we, before we well, continue. Well, it's very much in the spirit of the history of physics to have crazy theories that, <laughs> that turn out to work, first of all, and they, these crazy counterintuitive theories. Um, I mean, the point I would say is I mean, I, I'm quite happy, as it were, to leave it up to the listener to uh, – as it were, do their own inquiries, their own searches with regard to whether or not God is necessary for science to have progressed the way it has. I think it's a very interesting question that needs to be put on the table now uh, because historically science did arise in a very particular kind of way. Uh, and of course we are living in a period where atheism is becoming certainly more fashionable and more outspoken and more prominent. Uh, and then the question becomes, okay, 
uh, on what basis then do we continue to support science at the levels that we at which we have been supporting it, uh, given all the things that science d- does, not only the good stuff, but the bad stuff, right? Not only the stuff that's very easy to understand, but also the very abstract stuff that takes us to sort of regions of the galaxy we'll never have any kind of sensory contact with. Uh, and it seems to me that's a very important question to ask. If you take God out of the picture, what is the justification for giving that form of knowledge, which is so essential to the modern way of living, giving it that kind of significance? We are going to have to draw things to a close, but um, Victor will be with us again next week, uh, very kindly uh, staying on for another show. And um, we're going to be continuing this from a slightly different perspective. um, And I'll give you a clue as to what that is a little later on again in the programme. But for the moment, thank you, gentlemen, both for being with me. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Victor. (laughs) (laughs) I'll I'll post up web links, obviously, to both your websites, gents, um, and people can find out about your books there. But I'll post uh, links directly to those books as well um so we've been talking about uh, primarily with in victor's case his his uh, bestseller god the failed hypothesis and in steve's case um his new book science which is uh, just come out in the art of living series by acumen so uh, i do encourage you to uh, to get hold of both of those if you possibly can we'll be back in just a moment with some of your feedback to previous week's programming Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Well, we look forward to continuing the conversation with Victor at the same time next week as uh, he speaks to David Bartholomew on the statistical aspect of his work. But um, we've had lots of your response as well to today's show. Don't forget, if you want to respond uh, in person with people who have different views to you, Always welcome to log on to the Premier Community, the unbelievable group there, a thriving place for discussion on all matters of faith, science and uh, everything in between. So premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. You can click on the icon for the Premier Community. It'll take you straight to the unbelievable group there. <clears throat> and uh, if you want to get in touch with me, the easiest way to do that is to email unbelievable at premier.org.uk. About to read a lot of your emails from the last few weeks but you can also of course leave me a voicemail message 08456 52 52 52 and select option 8 to leave me one of those Uh, let's see what you've been saying about the show in the last few um, weeks now last week we were talking about slavery in the bible david instone brewer was in conversation with the bible geek uh, american scholar uh, bob price uh, with different views on whether the Bible, if you like, uh, it condemns slavery, how far it goes, if you like, in criticizing the institution. Um, is, is it Should it have gone further? Um, should Paul the Apostle have, if you like, nailed his colors to the mast and said slavery is wrong? Um, why didn't he go that far? Uh, all those sorts of issues were, 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 were discussed in last week's program. Now, here's one from Manuel, who says, Hi, your program is very good. Congratulations. I'm Manuel from Brazil. Uh, Concerning slavery, there are a lot of papal documents against it, and you list documents going back to the 1400s, which various popes have obviously uh, written on the issue of slavery. You say, I don't think it's fair to blame Christianity for slavery, but individual Christians have been responsible for it. And slavery in the Bible was simply the employment system of the time, and it's quite different from the employment system in the Middle Ages and different from what we have now. And I hope that in the future we could have an employment system even better than what we have now. Thank you very much. And it was interesting to to kind of get to grips with what exactly it meant to be a slave and and the kind of things associated with that. We may have a different uh, idea of what it would mean to be a slave in today's society. Ephraim um, wants to go back to the show before that. We were looking at that interesting book from Adam Bradford, The Jesus Discovery. Um, And Ephraim uh, uh, wants to comment on the the way that Adam, if you like, in that book claims that Jesus was more than just an itinerant preacher from a poor and lowly background. But he was a well-schooled Jewish rabbi who uh, would have been well known to the authorities before he started his preaching. Um, 
Ephraim says, obviously, as a Jewish listener to Premier, the debate was of great interest to me. Firstly, with regard to this notion of an ignorant fisherman, it should be noted that Jews then, as now, were a highly literate society. It was the duty of the Jewish father to teach his son Torah and a trade. Hence, most of the great rabbis were craftsmen. Dr. Bradford, however, seems to take the hard route when trying to prove that Jesus was educated. A glance at Jesus' teachings will indicate that, both in style and content, they are typically Pharisee, i.e. rabbinic. Most, if not all of them, can be paralleled in some traditional Jewish source. In fact, even some of the parables can be found in the primary rabbinic source, the Talmud. Hence, Jesus' teachings were not some radical departure from Jewish tradition. He was merely advocating a shift of emphasis from ritual to moral. He was certainly not out to found a new religion with himself as the deity. That came later with Paul and the influx of Gentiles into the movement. But that's another matter. Anyway, thanks for an interesting program, not to mention a nice web page too. Uh, and you thank me for the way I conduct the debates. Thank you, Ephraim. Of course, um, many would contest <laughs> the, the last part of your email there that uh, he wasn't out to found a new religion with himself as the deity. And that was really Paul and the influx of Gentiles that, that created that. And we've we've done that a few times here on the show. Um, what Jesus actually said about his, uh, if you like, God man status. Um, so if you want to look into that more, obviously many shows available on that subject. Uh, but hey, it might be fun to get you on Ephraim if that's the view you take and, and have a, a discussion, uh, especially as you're coming from a Jewish standpoint yourself. Linda wants to talk about those two programs we had on homosexuality. She wanted to respond specifically to Mike Dark, who on those programs, uh, as a gay Christian himself, was saying that essentially the Bible is not against loving, committed, faithful, same-sex relationships. You say, I fail to see Mike Dark's point of view at all, and his evidence didn't hold much water. His point seems to be that gay relationships didn't exist in Bible times as, the, as they do now, and therefore condones it. Well, that doesn't make sense because the Bible always defines sexual relationships as occurring between a man and a woman and everything outside of that falls under sexual perversion. The New Testament condemned orgies. Even though the orgies occurred between consenting adults, the fact that the adults were consenting to it was not a factor. The act in and of itself was wrong. I think that homosexuality also falls into that category. So regardless of whether it occurs between consenting people in a relationship or not, the act is condemned in the Bible quite clearly. I don't think the Bible suggests in any way at all that David and Jonathan or Ruth and Naomi were sexually intimate. You're referring here to the suggestion uh, uh, by email and, and, and in other ways that we had on those shows that uh, the relationship between King David and Jonathan was more than just friendship and indeed between Ruth and Naomi. You say you, do, you don't see that at all, that in British society it's not normal to have two people of the same sex being close or holding hands. Society interprets this sexually. However, in other cultures, such as French or Arabic culture, you have men holding hands and kissing each other on the cheek. This is normal cultural behaviour and is not sexual. I think all this needs to be seen in context and we shouldn't interpret it narrowly based on British culture today. Lastly, Mike Dark said that sometimes people may live together because they're reluctant to marry as a result of past experiences and that Christian rules sometimes force people to marry. I think that if you're not ready to marry, then you shouldn't marry. But also, you shouldn't be living together and having sex. You should stay friends with the intention of getting married and seek God's will until he gives you the peace to go ahead. Any church that condone, condones couples living together outside of marriage is, in my opinion, in error. Thank you for a great program, Justin. Can I suggest that maybe if you can find gay people who've, whose orientation have changed, it would be good for them to debate Mike Dark. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, now, um, a, a more of a general email here. Uh, this is coming from Young Nam. And uh, he wanted to talk both about that uh, program with Adam Bradford and uh, in general about uh, the type of discussions we have. You say, Nam, that you've been listening to the podcast for about a year now and have listened to probably a good third of the archive. Well done. There, there's, that's a big old archive, so you've done well to uh, to get through a third already. You say the discussions have been very interesting and helpful, even though I squirm a bit when I listen to some of your Christian guests. Have you ever considered D.A. Carson for your show? He's a brilliant and articulate Bible teacher and preacher who would do well on a variety of topics. For example, the historicity of Jesus, the problem of suffering, Pauline theology, inerrancy of scripture, postmodernism. I do know of D.A. Carson, and I think he would be a fabulous guest. Um, I, I ideally like my guests to, to be with me in the studio. I feel like we always 
get the best kind of uh, results from that kind of an interaction. But hey, if he's not over in the UK anytime soon, maybe we can get him on the phone. Um, I also noticed you continue that I tend to enjoy the Christian versus Christian discussions better than the Christian versus atheist ones. I think it's just because I've heard similar atheistic arguments and reasoning too many times and have simply grown a bit weary of them. I guess it's spiritually natural. There's a time when we have to move on from the milk to the meat, right? By the way, I think a cool series could be to go through the five points of Calvinism over the course of five weeks. So total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. I think another interesting hot topic could be the role of women in church. Not the only person actually in the last week to suggest that, young Nam. Um, there's someone else emailed me asking if we might do that particular topic. As always, I, I will put those ideas into the pot. Um, I tend to... Try not to overwhelm the show with the, the Christian into Christian discussions as much as I do love them and, and find them very interesting. Uh, I do see the, the the main thrust of this program being about uh, uh, Christian and non-Christian dialogue. But uh, very, bless you for your for your uh, appreciation of the show. Um, uh, you you wanted to also add some points about the, the the that that discussion between Adam Bradford and David Instone Brewer on the, the who Jesus was was he this this peasant fisherman turned preacher or was he uh, trained in rabbinical scholarship adam bradford said that if jesus were trained under rabbinical scholarship that it would explain why saul who may have looked up to jesus was so disappointed well you say that simply doesn't hold up since saul never met christ until his conversion in first corinthians fifteen eight, paul calls himself as one who was untimely born because he met christ last also it's clear that jesus was opposed to the pharisees during his ministry jesus stressed love and forgiveness while the pharisees were legalists jesus pronounced all foods clean jesus worked on the sabbath and most of all jesus claimed that he was the only begotten son of the father i find it hard to believe that jesus would have learned this under rabbinical education of jesus's time and indeed he did train with the rabbis if he had trained with the rabbis he would have been expelled Imagine how awkward it must have been when Jesus was holding to these doctrines while his teachers weren't. Imagine the academic confrontations they would have had. Uh, thank you very much. Anyway, um, interesting, isn't it, uh, to, to look at some of those. Uh, I suppose they're, they're in a way slightly conjectural, any theory about what Jesus did and said and how he trained and how he had his learning in those years that the Bible simply doesn't spell out for us but it was a, a good show to kind of to have a little speculation um, Seth just a short email from Seth says I've listened to three or four of your podcasts now I'm a little behind as you can tell I just finished the one from May the 15th I think that was when Peter Hitchens joined us to talk about his new book The Rage Against God uh, you say, I wonder if I'm alone in thinking that Adam Rutherford, the atheist, was not permitted to completely develop any point of view because Peter Hitchens would continually interrupt him. I do love the podcast. I have them downloaded. Try to listen every weekend. Thank you, Seth. And uh, I do appreciate you getting in touch. I appreciate everyone who gets in touch. And anyone who emails me, certainly for the first time, um, will receive a thank you from me for, for, for emailing. Um, Pastor Timothy Deerhamer. Um, now, you are... For once, someone who isn't in the States emailing me. You're actually over here. Um, but interestingly, I think you're still uh, a Yank. So even even when I get an email from the UK, it's still from an American. You say, I've become an avid listener to Unbelievable. I was pointed in the direction of Premier Radio through Tony Campolo's podcast. I'm the senior pastor of St. Anne's Lutheran Church in London. I just signed up to the Premier Community and found I couldn't choose Lutheran as my denomination, exclamation mark. Although there are only about 150,000 Lutherans in the UK, Lutherans are the largest Protestant group in the world. I didn't even know there were that many in the UK, actually. Uh, but uh, have you ever considered a Lutheran voice on Unbelievable? You ask Timothy. Um, Lutherans have a different take on the world than our Reformed and Anglican brothers and sisters, and it's a voice that's not heard often in the UK. Not only am I a Lutheran pastor, I'm from Oklahoma in the United States, so I could also offer that perspective as well. My ministry has been marked by ecumenical involvement. My church in the US, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, even featured some of my work in a documentary. So uh, now pastor of a Lutheran church in Great Britain, it would be really interesting to meet you, Timothy. See if we can set something up. Well, uh, lots and lots of uh, emails. <clears throat> I can't get to them all, I'm afraid. Maybe we've got, we've got time for one more. Um, Aaron wanted to ask, uh, after recently stumbling across your engaging interview with Alvin Plantinga, he, of course, is a, um, a famed Christian uh, theologian and philosopher, 
You say you've since enjoyed many of the other interviews and debates um, that you really enjoy the show. If at all possible, I'd love to hear more from Christian philosophers on the program. Is there any chance of interviewing, for instance, Richard Swinburne in the not too distant future? Yeah, um, I, again, it'll go in the pot, Aaron. And indeed, I'm, I'm trying to actually set up, if possible, some point, not in too distant future, another show with Alvin Planting. We, we obviously had him for that that initial um, sort of extended interview that you heard. But uh, I'd, lo- I'd love to see him actually in conversation with an atheist on something like the problem of evil or or um, his, 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 his um, I think, brilliant argument that... Uh, accepting evolution actually require is a, is a defeater of naturalism of, mat, of materialism um so who knows we'll see what we can do see what we can do i can't promise more than that for the moment that's uh, enough of your emails uh, sorry for those i haven't got to and don't forget you can email me and i will try and read out as many as possible unbelievable at premier.org.uk well it's time to say goodbye now but do come back next week because I'll tell you what's coming. You're unbelievable. Victor Stenger joins me again. This time he's in conversation with David Bartholomew. David is a statistician. That's his area of expertise with the London School of Economics, um, emeritus professor there. He will be arguing that Victor, in his book, God, the Failed Hypothesis, fails to actually use his data correctly. And that um, you simply can't put God into a sort of scientific test in the way that Victor would like. We'll be finding out what objections he has to Victor's belief that uh, he's disproved God scientifically on next week's show. Do hope you can join me for that. And uh, don't forget to uh, listen out for all the other great programmes here on Premier Christian Radio. But until next week, have a great one. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show that gets you thinking here on Premier Christian Radio. It's unbelievable, a show that regularly brings together Christians and non-Christians for discussion and debate. And uh, we've got a cracker of a show lined up for you today, as we had last week. As uh, I continue to chat with uh, my special guest over from the States at the moment, Victor Stenger, a US physicist and an atheist and author of God, the Failed Hypothesis. Let me tell you, though, what we're talking about on today's programme. You're unbelievable. Well, in conversation with Victor this week is David Bartholomew, who is uh, a Christian himself. He's the Emeritus Professor of Statistics at the London School of Economics. And uh, he is due, due shortly to publish a paper critiquing Victor's work, um, particularly in regards to his book, God, the Failed Hypothesis, which we've been looking at across these two weeks. We're going to find out why David objects to the way Victor uses um, data and statistics in making his case against God. And it'll throw up all kinds of questions like, um, can we you know, analyse scientifically things like whether intercessory prayer works? Um, what about, um, if you like, putting God in the test tube in this way? Is it even valid to do that in the first place? So uh, we should have a fascinating show on our hands, as we always do here on the show, that gets you thinking. Unbelievable. Right through till four o'clock this afternoon. Well, gentlemen, it's uh, wonderful to have you both in the studio with me. Um, <clears throat> Victor, you're back again. Uh, so thank you for joining us again. Victor, yeah, it's good to be here. You, you've, you've had a lot of response to this book, The Failed Hypothesis, God, The Failed Hypothesis. It came out a few years ago now. Um, that was in seven years. Um, so tell us, uh, wh- why do you think people are so interested in this? Why, why, why did it make the New York Times bestseller list and things like that? Well, it helped by coming out uh, with a series, uh, soon after a series of other books appeared, uh, that, in fact, have been labeled uh, the new atheism, starting with uh, Sam Harris's book, uh, uh, The End of Faith. Then he also wrote a follow-up to that letter to, uh, a, Christian letter to a Christian nation. Mm-hmm. Then mm-hmm. it was was uh, Richard Dawkins' uh, huge uh, bestseller. Uh, the, well, I, we've heard of yeah, that, yes, <laughs> The God Delusion. The God Delusion. It's, <laughs> I saw him uh, the other day. The other day in, in Copenhagen, and, and uh, he, he mentioned to me that it's now sold three million copies in English alone. Wow, so, extraordinary! And, and so, and he was kind enough to do a, a jacket blurb for my book. So people, I think, saw Richard Dawkins on the front there, and they said, "Wait, well, we'll take a look at this." And <laughs> that, that helped a lot. I also got 
a nice blurb from Sam Harris. And then in, in the paperback edition that came later, uh, I, I got Christopher Hitchens, who had written another one of these bestseller books, to do the uh, uh, do forward. So, so I had these all these. You, you had at uh, least three guys. of the four horsemen, yeah, as them, it were. I had them um, in, <laughs> right. So. Uh, well, I mean, obviously, you're part of that wave then of, of new atheist literature that's coming out. Obviously, yours, not so much a rhetorical sort of attack as in, in the way that Hitchens is and Sam Harris to some extent, but much more trying to take a, a, put your scientific mind to the question of God. And, and you, you, you treat God in many ways as uh, just another hypothesis to be tested and that if we look at the observational data, we can draw the reasonable conclusion that God does not exist. And in fact, um, one way of, of summing that up, as we mentioned on the show last week, is this statement, not only does the universe show no evidence for God, but it looks exactly as it would be expected to look if there is no God. That that kind of encapsulates where you're coming from, I think. Yes, that's right. That, that's Fantastic. a summary. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us again on the program. Um, now, uh, new to this program altogether is David Bartholomew. Um, David, as I mentioned, a Christian himself, and he's Emeritus Professor of Statistics at the London School of Economics. Thank you for joining us today, David. How, have you sort of always been a Christian? Um, has Have you ever had any conflicts between your beliefs and uh, the acad- academic kind of uh, circles you, you run in? Well, I've been a Christian and a statistician, as I said, as long as I can remember, which means roughly to the age of 18. You know, before that, one has only very vague memories. Uh, I've had a number of posts, and I've always insisted on being statistics, not biological statistics or any other kind. Because, but I, I think in the context of this discussion, I'd like to call it statistical science, because essentially I regard myself as a scientist. Um, the sort of statistician I am is concerned with drawing inferences from data, uh, from data unser- where there's uncertainty. And it was basically because modern statistics is based on probability theory that I really got into this field. Um, when I was, I don't know, an undergraduate, Charles Coulson was professor of Railsport Professor of Mathematics at Oxford, and I heard him talk on a number of occasions. Um, I've never had occasion to refer to his work, but he was very influential. Um, he had thought quite seriously about these subjects, and I thought I would as well. And partly I think there's a consistency in one's own thinking. You can't keep whatever beliefs you have and how you practice your trade in separate compartments. So I was always interested in bringing them together. And uh, I hadn't read all Victor's books. I've read some of them, and in particular, God the Failed Hive, which particularly caught my attention because I won't say it's a statistics book, but he uses statistical methods to test the hypothesis of God's existence. And he argues that if God is present and active in the world, it ought to be detectable. There have been, I think you say, Victor, millions or maybe trillions of prayers, and there ought to be some sign that they've had an effect. And therefore, if one can collect the right data and subject them to appropriate scientific analysis, um, we should be able to test this hypothesis. So that's how I came at this thing. Um, Last week, Victor said that in his experience, most scientists who do have a faith sort of have a a left and right kind of um, partitioning of the brain or something where they, they do their science in the lab and they go to church and they're doing something completely different and they never the twain really exist together is that the way it works for you or is it different not really because the statistician doesn't have a lab <laughs> you're a kind of consultant to all sorts and conditions of of other scientists not very often from the physics end of the spectrum most commonly biology psychology which is where i'm working now and the social sciences generally and that is very much more difficult but is there, in a sense, a compartmentalization? Uh, perhaps we could call it non-overlapping magisteria or whatever term we want to call it. You know, th- this idea that your faith is one thing and your scientific approach is different and the two really, you know, don't have any bearing. No, on that's not the way it is. I mean, for practical purposes, you do certain things at certain times. Sure. But all as I would think you do one with the other in the back of your mind. If you are listening and you'd like to weigh in, you'd like to uh, perhaps uh, give your opinion on anything you hear, uh, perhaps respond yourself to the issues we're looking at today, then uh, it would be great to hear from you via the email. That's unbelievable at premier.org.uk. And if you want to uh, phone your voicemail 
comment in, then you can do that at the voicemail line for the show, which is 08456 52 52 52 and select option eight. And we'll be hearing some of your responses to last week's show between Victor and uh, Steve Fuller, which was, uh, well, it was a lively encounter. I'll say that much. And um, we'll see what your reactions to it were uh, towards the end of the programme today. Uh, In the meantime, if you want to hear that programme and indeed you want to listen again to this or to let someone else know about it, don't forget the web address of Unbelievable where you can download the podcast uh, you can send on the show to other people. You can find out more about the show and the uh, the characters we have on here. That's at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. Again, premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. So, David, your paper is due to be published, I think, in the uh, Science and Christian Belief Journal that's associated with the Faraday Institute. Um, you, you, you start off um, looking at one of the types of um, uh, sets of data that Victor uses in um, his uh, belief that God is a failed hypothesis. Uh, in particular, this one about does intercessory prayer work? So maybe to start us off with, with why you feel Victor's approach, where you feel the flaws are in, in the way Victor tries to, to tackle the whole area. Well, I hope Victor will interrupt me if I haven't characterised his position properly, but I think he's arguing there ought to be empirically detectable signs of God's action in the world, and these ought to be measurable and testable by the the methods of, of science. I think the intercessory prayer is a very good example because one can identify what it is being prayed for and in the case of the medical application, which is the usual one that's been discussed, there are clear signs of whether it, it's worked. And um, if I can come to my conclusion first, my conclusion mm. is that the experiment that, or the two experiments I think described in the book, actually don't deliver the goods and perhaps I should explain why. I mean, there are many um, so-called experiments on the efficacy of intercessory prayer, and I think Stenger and Victor calls them anecdotal, and I'm inclined to agree with them. They haven't been controlled. And again, if I'm right, I think he regards the double-blind randomised trial as the gold standard for doing this thing. Now, for those who are not familiar with those terms, what, what just uh, briefly, what, what is a double-blind randomised trial? When it's... Well, the term is used primarily in clinical studies where you're t- testing a new drug. You want to know whether it works. So the basic idea is you give the drug to some people and you don't give it to the others, and if it works, there's a difference. But there are problems in doing this because... Um, if a person knows they're not they're getting the drug, it may affect their reaction. It's well known that people react to sugar pills that mm. have the placebo effect. So you have to make sure the patient doesn't know whether they're getting the dummy or the real thing. It's also possible that the person administering the drug will convey by the, even their actions something which gives a clue as to what mm. is happening, and that may... Um, Again, influence yeah, the result. They may sure. influence the... Um, Then you have to apply it to two groups. Now, people react to drugs very differently. So if you happen to have one highly reactive group and one unreactive group, the difference would be due to the people and not due to the drug. So you mix them up in what's called a randomised trial. You basically allocate them at random so there can be no known bias. And then if the treatment group comes out best, you've got pretty definite evidence and that's how clinical trials and, work. And this is the way that, that science works. This is, you know, uh, what we might define as a scientific approach to yeah. gaining the evidence so that it's yeah. unbiased. You control everything you can, and what you can't control you basically randomise so that nothing out there that you haven't thought mm. of has a serious effect. Now, as I understand, Victor, there are two tr- what I'll call prayer trials which meet all the requirements of, of a, a valid test. People are invited to pray for the recovery of of a group. I think some other non-physical, but as it were, non-spiritual things were tried as well. Um, But again, that's not very relevant. Um, Now, the answer to this was that there was no significant difference between the recovery rate or whatever of um, those who are prayed for and those who are not. 
There are other variations in the design. It might matter whether people know they're being prayed for sure. and that sort of thing. But I don't think that affects the principle what we're saying. Now, I have two objections to the conclusion drawn from that. One is that the prayer study does not exactly match the clinical study. Because in the clinical study, there are two parties. There's the patient and the people dealing with the patient. In the prayer trial, there are three parties, and one is God. Now, you have to allow that God might be a party, otherwise you're not doing the experiment. And it seems to me quite unjustified to suppose that God will be manipulated by our prayers. Um, If he were, he wouldn't be God in the sense that I understand him. And therefore, if I had been funding this study, I said there's no way we're going to get a a conclusive answer out of this. Um, Well, this is where where, uh, I'd like to step in. Uh, and that let, is let me just say, because we have, it hasn't been stated that the two, the, the two um, studies you reference showed that there was no apparent effect of prayer. That, that was the, the result that was drawn yeah, from, I'm, from well, these. Okay, let me, let, before we go on, let's, let's, let me first ask you, are you questioning my conclusion or are you questioning the conclusions of the authors of these studies? Your conclusion. Right. I mean, I mean, as just, I understand I just quote it, some numbers here, uh, uh, p values and so on, uh, the yeah. sort of thing that I, I I am quite familiar from my own research. Used them all all my life, but always in in more of a heuristic way than in, a, in an exact statistical way. It's just that we have in in physics we have our own kind of rule. We may uh, get round to that later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that uh, if, if you get a p value of of one in ten thousand, and then you're 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 safe. This is a probability value. Isn't yeah. It? Well, it's it's, it's this uh, uh, has to do with what's the probability that a random uh, event uh, would give you the result you observe, or a greater result. But that's well, crudely what it is. Well, what do you make though of of the, the basic point that that David's making first of all, which is that you you've kind of it's not equivalent to a clinical test because yeah, I always, you have to assume I, I that God I, is involved. I thought I made it clear that, and that's why I wanted to look at what I actually said, that certainly if you get a negative result, you can explain it away by just saying, well, God just didn't uh, happen to think that uh, these people deserved. Uh, he, he has the right to do that. He's, he's God, after all. He can do whatever he wants. And, and my argument is that nevertheless... If the result had been positive, people would have jumped upon it. So if you say that there's no way for such an experiment to be conclusive, I disagree. I think that the experiment would be one way that you could show that God exists. If you found that uh, uh, you did a series of experiments of this sort, uh, very, very well conducted uh, experiments that... All the skeptics look at it and agree with uh, that it have been done right, and you get a, a, a definitely strong statistical significant result that's also replicable by other people. And, and you find that, for example, that only Catholic prayers worked, and, and Protestant prayers didn't work, and Hindu prayers didn't work. Uh, then, then you would uh, have to conclude. Uh, I couldn't think any of any natural explanation for that result, and so I would have to conclude this pretty good evidence that maybe there is a God after all out there and that the Catholics had it right all along. Okay. So I, th- I think that would be a positive uh, a way in which God could be detected. Now that brings me to my second objection. Um, what would we have concluded had there been a positive result? Say a, a big... Then I would argue you still couldn't cl- conclude that God is acting there. Um, or at least... You might conclude that there was some kind of external being who was influencing things and was doing what you asked them to do. Yes. Um, Well, that's why I bring up the the specific case of of where. I mean, it's like any other experiment. You try. You you might. It might take a whole series of experiments to pin down the the details. Once you have a positive result, and then you find, oh, this kind of prayer works, and this kind of prayer doesn't work. Well, then you'd really uh, gradually. Uh, zero in on the, on the supernatural uh, hypothesis. Well, let's bring the paranormal into it, because if that result had occurred, every paid-up atheist would have jumped in and said, well, that's not God, that's something that we don't understand about the universe. Mm-hmm. You can actually... It's a mind-over-matter thing. Now, I know you don't 
um, approve of that either. But that, that is a possible explanation, and that will always be in the background as a possible explanation. That's right. And, and that's, therefore, that's why you, you – that's why – Every physicist in the country, in all countries, would jump at the opportunity to start doing experiments on on this. First of all, they would get funded. Uh, Funding would be easy. And uh, believe me, I've been a research – I was a research scientist for 40 years, and there's nothing more important to a research scientist than his funding. Uh, It makes makes his whole life possible. So uh, they would jump at the opportunity to – to pursue this further, and there would be plenty of opportunities, and eventually you would zero in. You'd, you'd like in any other kind of experiment, you'd zero in on the properties of the uh, of the phenomenon that you're observing. What, what's your ultimate point there, though, David? That, that our our worldview will always, in some sense, bias what we take away yes, from. So are you saying the that findings? this is impossible? That this would not be a feasible uh, outcome of of uh, I don't think you could establish the existence or the non-existence of God by this kind of experiment. You could produce some relevant information, which have to go into the arguments. But let me give you another example from astrology, which I know you don't believe in either. But um, it's alleged by astrologers that the birth sign affects the kind of person you are. Now, in France, as I understand it, they record the time of birth, and therefore it's possible to determine in principle under what sign you were born. And people have quite seriously investigated this to see whether people, whether they call it the Mars effect, whether people born under the sign of Mars are more warlike or whatever Mars is held to be. Now, most of these things don't come out significant, but that particular one does. Now, that hasn't made me believe in astrology because there are other explanations. I don't know what the explanation is, but my guess is that knowing that you're born under Mars and knowing this is supposed to make you what a warlike or whatever, you'll more likely turn to military occupations or whatever. And that is that is a possible explanation. I don't know whether it's right. And it doesn't matter whether it's right. All that matters is there is another explanation there. So that's... Well, that's a good example of, of, of uh, a non-double-blind experiment. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, that would not be a good experiment by your own... Uh, that's that's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, but they were very large numbers because a very large number of... I, I don't believe in astrology because of that. Mm-hmm. And as you indicate, there are the weaknesses in the, the design of that, which you would want to call into question if you got down to that level. Yeah. What I'm merely saying is that if you get an effect, you can't attribute it necessarily to God or the paranormal or whatever you want. So so in, essentially what, what we've come round to is, is that David is suggesting that in this specific example, and, and you take this kind of a symptomatic of the way Victor treats his the way he incorporates god into the these these kind of analyses generally that that you you can't do that and and get anything that tells you really anything about god because we we we're simply not in a well, position I, to, to I, I totally, if god is a third I totally party disagree i mean i thought i just gave you a very specific uh, example of how the existence of god would be proven to my satisfaction i'll tell you, if those catholic prayers were the only prayers that worked uh, I was I was baptized as a Catholic, so I'd be ready to go right back to the Catholic Church. I'd go, f- go find the nearest church, go down to the uh, to the uh, uh, confessional. Say, "Bless me, Father, for I have sinned." Uh, it's been fifty years since my last confession, and, and uh, I would be back in the fold. So, what what would what's your reaction to that, David? I mean, uh, would you kind of if if there was a positive result, say, okay? God, God does exist. I mean, that what what Victor's accusing you of here is, is in a sense, um, you know, hypocrisy. That that if it were positive, you would say yes, and if as it's negative, you say, well, we just don't know what God would do in circumstances, so it doesn't make sense to to test. No, I'm saying we don't know in either case. I mean, I wouldn't have funded one of those studies if anyone had asked me for two and a half million pounds, because I was said at the outset, you're not going to get a clear answer. Um, but it may be worth doing for other reasons. Um, I mean, but but I mean, I suppose Victor's offering this as a thought experiment. What if it had given a clear indication that all Catholics' prayers? I would were say answered? that the people doing these experiments certainly disagreed with you. I'm sure well, well, they they thought, I, I, and incidentally, most of the people doing these experiments are believers. People like Harold Koenig at, uh, at Duke University, uh, who's the head of of a whole uh, 
institute that's devoted to uh, searching for connections between religion and health, a fellow that I, I know uh, a little bit, uh, because I've, I've communicated with him by email at least, I've never met mm-hmm. him personally, and I, I find he's a, a fine, honest, uh, 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 excellent scientist. And uh, I think people like uh, him who, who are doing this work are really, you know, they're believers and they, uh, they really want to uh, uh, show that God exists, that's their motivation, but at the same time, and I, this is, I, I have the great respect, greatest respect for them because they go where the data goes. They are not trying to cheat in any way. Uh, they just uh, are willing to uh, to be good scientists uh, and and go wherever the data goes. And I have absolutely no uh, complaint about them at all. Well, I think they're wrong. If they would have, been, if their experiment had been successful in the terms we're talking about, mm-hmm. and they had concluded that proves there is God, I would have said you can't conclude that. It may be true, and what you're observing may be what God is doing. Though, if I'd be a bit disturbed if God was somebody who responded to my pulling strings, mm-hmm. um, which I, I mean, I, there are a lot of people who think. Uh, uh, and one of my former colleagues was involved in a sequential experiment where they prepared in sequence and stopped. And I think it, in scientific terms, it was a waste of time. You seem to have a theological uh, uh, belief here that uh, God uh, wouldn't uh, uh, react. He wouldn't be, be willing to show his presence by way of... of uh, of giving a positive result in the prayer test. Is that what you're kind of implying That's right, here? yes. Yeah. Uh, you mean, see, now that's, that's uh, you know, that's the God that hides from us. Yes. Okay? And there's a very, there are very good arguments against such a God. There, there are several philosophical arguments called, it's, it's called the hiddenness argument, that God uh, could hide himself from us and there's just nothing. I mean, everybody agrees there's no scientific evidence for God. If there was scientific evidence for God, it would be in the uh, textbooks along with the scientific evidence for neutrinos and quarks and DNA and and everything else. But uh, uh, it isn't. And so why isn't there? Well, God is, uh, obviously, he could be hiding from us. And the argument is that such a God... uh, cannot exist. Such a God cannot exist who is the God that most people worship, namely a God who is omniscient, omnibenevolent, and, you know, and uh, uh, what's the third choice? Uh, omnipotent. Anyway. Yeah. Well, well, all the omnipotent. Uh, but, uh, omnipotent. Yeah. <laughs> and, and such a God, uh, well, first of all, a good God, a, a good God, a moral God would not deliberately hide himself from people who uh, are open to the possibility. Okay, of, so so, uh, so for God to play fair, he should at least cooperate with our scientific experiments. Is that yeah? I mean, what he, you're right. He 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 shouldn't deliberately hide from us uh, if we really are searching for him. I, I mean, what uh, what do you make of this, though? Because obviously, you you come with an assumption about the character of God, and so does Victor here, who says, "Well, if God is the God you claim He is, then He should be upfront with His existence and not sort of try to." Sub, subvert my my experiments on intercessory prayer i'm not saying that god hides himself in i think the way victor is talking about what all i'm claiming at the moment is that one cannot be certain of his presence by scientific experiment double blind or whatever in other words you can't put god to the test um in that kind of way and you shouldn't expect to why not because if you could, God wouldn't be God, in my understanding. I mean, it, God well, is not it, subject to my whims and fences. To take it to a biblical level, it was, of course, Jesus who 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 said that. Do, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test when he's uh, asked to do that very thing by Satan in the wilderness. But that biblical uh, reference aside, we're going to... Paul we, also we, said God is detectable. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you could, you could find any, any answer to anything in the Bible. Well, we're going to have to take a quick break, gents, and we'll be back in just a moment. Um, we, we'll get more into this as, as the show progresses, because this isn't obviously the only area that you focus on in your critique of, of Victor's um, work here, David. Um, so, so we'll continue in a moment. Um, David Bartholomew joins me today uh, in conversation with Victor Stenger. 
as we look at the question of whether God is a failed hypothesis, as uh, Victor's book um, uh, claims. And um, as I said, we'll have uh, links to both my guests and how you can find out more about them and the organizations they represent. Uh, David Bartholomew's paper, shortly to come out um, on, in the Science and Christian Belief Journal, says that um, essentially Stenger has... Uh, sort of used scientific sampling in an, in an invalid way to make his case and we'll we'll hear more from david on why he believes that in a short moment's time so uh do stay tuned to the show that gets you thinking here on premier christian radio we'll be back in just a moment you're listening to unbelievable on premier christian radio Welcome back to the show. And uh, in conversation today, atheist U.S. physicist Victor Stenger is with me, author of God the Failed Hypothesis, a New York Times bestseller. And um, last year he wrote another book, The New Atheism, Taking a Stand for Science and Reason. He believes that uh, science and reason have really put the idea of God to bed. David Bartholomew begs to differ. He's a Christian. He's Emeritus Professor of Statistics at the London School of Economics and he's uh, recently written a paper due to be published shortly critiquing Stenger's uh, way that he uses data to suggest that God is a failed hypothesis. Um, we'll, we'll also look in this section of the programme at whether Stenger, well, Victor, why, why, why are you surnames, eh? <laughs> whether Victor takes the Christian view of God seriously. That's something that uh, David is keen to point out, that, that he feels that Victor uh, pays li- very little attention to what Christians actually believe about God and Jesus. And that's important when we're actually undertaking any kind of scientific endeavour to find out whether this God exists. So, um, <clears throat> gentlemen, let's continue from more or less where we left off. Um, y- y- more in general, we've been talking about this, this, these studies on intercessory prayer and why you object to them being in any way used as, as evidence for or against God. Um, David, but you, you feel that in general, the way Victor uses um, s- sampling in the book, um, there, there's a kind of uh, uh, he, he's he, he's he's scientific when it comes to science, but not very scientific when it comes to other data. So you 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 quote the fact that he says the empirical fact is that people with no religion are not noticeably less charitable than those with religion and 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 you have a concern that that there is a tendency among scientists and perhaps richard dawkins does similar things in the god delusion to, to kind of become rather unscientific when they start talking about what they perceive to be um the the effect of religion or the, the these things and we, we need to approach that in just as much a scientific way what, what why why are you concerned about that particularly well, the particular example you quoted is one among many one which could find in the literature, which are basically comparing Christian people with non-Christian people and arguing that the difference is what isn't what you would expect it to be. Now, I argue that Victor departs from his scientific creed when he gets onto that. He merely says it's an empirical fact. He doesn't give any references, whether it relates to American adults, how many non-respondents and so There are a whole series of questions which a statistician would want to ask before doing that. I mean, Richard Dawkins has a rather notorious example where he says only 3% of fellows of the Royal Society believe in God or something until you look at the size of his sample and the response and the fact that people... You know, there are questions of that kind which have to be answered. And I feel that scientists should be scientific across the board. And that's a good example that you've quoted. And and you feel there's a a double standard at work there. What's your response? Well, it's it's anecdotal to Mm. use Victor's name. Well, I... I, I, uh, In in all my books, I I try to be... uh, very accurate with my references and so on and I may have missed one occasionally but I really do try to make uh, to when, when I make a a, a statement uh, a factual statement that is based on documentation I really make a strong attempt to to reference that I go to a lot of trouble <laughs> and if you look at my books you'll see the, the huge bibliography so if I missed something uh I'd be happy to correct that. I'd be happy to put that reference in the next edition that you just pointed out to me, where I where I say something without a reference. Well, you didn't give a reference, but we're all like that. Um, but I'm saying that is fairly typical of what I call the new atheists. That one standard appears to apply, for example, when they talk about what people... Now, measuring charitability is a major problem in itself. I'm not aware that anyone has done it. You have to define what you mean. Measuring 
variables of this kind is a, yeah, is but, a nightmare. But we're not, not using that to argue there's no God. We're, right. just, we're just using that as a defense to some extent because there are so many people, especially in America, I mean, you don't probably run into it here the way we do there, uh, where you will have uh, uh, people on Fox News, Bill O'Reilly, uh, pe- uh, some of the authors that are out there like Ann Coulter, uh, uh, people like Pat Robertson, who make statements that uh, uh, if you if if we had atheism, if we didn't have have religion, uh, everybody would be going around killing everybody else, and and every, every, every it would be a, uh, uh, a miserable world of, of of hatred and and violence, and yet there's no evidence for that. There's no evidence that atheists are any worse than than anybody else. There are countries like the uh, Scandinavian countries where God belief is very low, and like uh, Britain now where God belief is, is getting uh, uh, lower and lower. There's no evidence that that has changed the uh, moral fiber uh, of people in any way, and that's the only point we're trying to make there. David, I mean, ultimately, in a sense, that's more of a critique of the general approach here. Perhaps not. it doesn't sort of refer directly to whether... Victor's thesis is, is wrong or not, but but going back to this intercessory prayer studies, etc. In what is, is there just a general sense that you don't feel Victor's approach is valid? That that I mean, I'm getting the feeling that you're suggesting when it comes to a concept like God, you can't do you can't analyze God in the way that Victor hopes to be doing that that you know to be looking for empirical data and testing it and then coming to conclusions. You you believe. It, it just doesn't make sense to treat God in the same way as we would treat any material phenomena. Well, that we I try can't to think of any experiment which could be conducted or any observational data which be collected which wouldn't be open to the kind of objections I've raised on the the, the medical one. Mm. I mention them because that's very clear cut. There's a clear measure of success. It's very easy to observe what is happening. It's very easy to put in controls to make sure that nothing funny is happening but if i could go back to his example no, but i mean i disagree with you 100 percent. i gave you a precise uh, example of, of how how god could be have been discovered by just such an experiment by finding by finding that only one kind of prayer works then you would have and and, and uh, that prayer happened to correspond to to uh, one of the great faiths and not to any of the others, you, you, do, you could draw no other conclusion that that particular faith was the correct faith after all. I, I, don't, see how, you, I don't see how you have provided me with any uh, answer to that. If it were the case, as you hypothesized, that only Catholic prayers worked, that Catholics were in some sense had a special relationship which made God listen to them, Mm-hmm. If if you present to me the result of an experiment with that result, I say there's something very funny going on here. I wouldn't immediately judge, jump to the conclusion that God had a special spot in His heart for Catholics or whoever. Oh, I think a lot of a lot of scientists would say, "Well, that can't be right," and you'd have a long period of trying to uh, of trying to confirm this and or disconfirm it. It wouldn't happen overnight, certainly. But, uh, but is, if that, is, isn't if the that point held that up, I don't see how you, you still that we we don't have any such result. All we have is something which, as far as Dave is concerned, doesn't actually tell us anything because it's it's misconceived from its from its outset. I mean, well, it just adds to the body of knowledge that we have. Uh, by itself, it doesn't prove God doesn't exist, but it adds to the body of knowledge that God does not exist. So it, there's a cumulative case yes. here for, for yes. that, I, well, I mean, every time you look at some. Uh, look for some sign. The sign isn't there, and the sign the, the sign should be some sign there. Some. Do, do you agree with this concept that Victor has of God that that with a God who is in theory supporting the universe and every particle within it, that there should be some sign, scientifically testable sign of his existence? Um, I mean, some would say that we have, if you like, um, we we can make conclusions on the basis, and I'm. This is another area that, that, that Victor has been looking at of things like the fine tuning of the universe, etc., where where we can conclude that there must be a an agency at work in some way. But I mean, is that so, something that you would say is is a kind of scientific way of um, proving God in any way? 
David yourself, or or, or do you just feel that that this is where science can't help us when it comes to disproving or proving? In God? a strict sense, I think science can't. I think there is a vast amount of evidence out there. I mean, Victor says I quite quite rightly that if God is the kind of God that Christians believe Him to be, He must be doing something. The question is whether you can detect that by controlled scientific experiments or not, or whether it has to rest on an accumulation of what I think we would both call anecdotal evidence, because in the nature of the case, that's the only evidence we've got. Um, No, I I, I would disagree. I have absolutely no confidence whatsoever in anecdotal evidence. I wouldn't rely rely on it for anything uh, so important as such an issue. I, I would re- uh, expect... Uh, oh, but I'm claiming you do use anecdotal evidence when it suits. And I mentioned that um, example of the um, uh, whether Christians are more charitable or not than others. No, but that's not part of my argument against the existence of God. Well, why did you put it in the book, then? To, to help defend, defend uh, atheism to some extent. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean... It, you, you, you. Perhaps it's time to move move the discussion on, gentlemen, to the fact that you, towards the end of your paper, David, you, you suggest that Stenger, um, in Victor, in the way that he uh, conceptualizes God and the, the kind of God that he is looking to uh, find or disprove, um, that you you say he doesn't understand the core theology of the Christian God, and that's essential. Tell us a bit about this and why why you feel that there's a problem here. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I haven't read all the New Atheism books, but I've read many of them. And I get the impression that they all define religion as a set of propositions. Basically, you can write down a set of propositions describing the person of God and other things as well. And then you go around looking to see whether they're falsified. I don't think Christianity or any other religion, as far as I know, I speak of Christianity, which is the one I know, is about a set of propositions. I don't believe creeds are where you start. I think creeds are where you end. Um, in a, that's speaking very loosely. You don't say to a person, believe A, B, C, and D, and then you're in. No one has ever said that to me, and I'm not aware of any Christian group in this country that would say that. I well, can't that's speak. the foundation of Christianity. The, no, it uh, isn't. The, uh, what, what was that creed back in three, th- 330? Three or 400, it took them 400 years to get all that down in some agree for. Even then they fought over it because it's yeah. so difficult. And I remember <laughs> the, having to recite the Apostles' Creed and so on. And I know uh, that uh, I happen to be interested in what Sarah Palin's religion was, and I looked it up. The Pentecostal religion, and there's a big creed that they that they have to read. I believe sure. in this, and I but, believe but in that. The, oh, the, I, I say creeds, but in the that is the point I've come to. I find they pretty fairly express. You want to argue about all of it? Well, and you're, the, you're and language is language. You're a sophisticated thinker, and you're pro, you're and you're undoubted. I'll, I'll admit, we'll cut short this, this story. That the that the the God of the theologians, the God the God of people who. Uh, Really uh, have made a lifetime of of, of studying the the issue uh, is much more sophisticated and, and and much more interesting in a lot of ways. Uh, but that's not the God that the new atheists uh, were writing about. The, the the new atheists have been writing about the God that most people worship, which is a very simple picture of a God, a God that uh, uh, talks to them, a God that uh, provides them with. Uh, Comforts and uh, life ever after, and so on. Those, that's that's the the God that uh, that uh, we were concerned with when we were writing about. In my book, Quantum Gods, I did get into the God of the theologians, including a, a God of your own theolo- theological well, uh, well, tendencies. Well, t- t- tell us then uh, exactly, David, why you feel that Victor has mischaracterized the the God that you believe in. Well, the short answer is that he's on the outside and I'm on the inside. And that's a matter of free choice. And if you're on the inside of anything, the world looks differently. If you're on the inside of a marriage, it looks different to if you're outside, particularly if you've made a lifelong commitment. You can't know what that is like unless you've done it. And you can't know what it's like to be a Christian unless you are one. So it's subjective, <laughs> and I'm not concerned about the subjective beliefs of people. I'm concerned about about the objective reality of of a superpower, a super being out there that's beyond all all uh, reason. But you dismiss subjectivity as if it's unimportant. In what sense is it important, David? <laughs> because I'm me, 
I mean, well, you can believe whatever you want. I mean, you're you're absolutely uh, totally within your rights to to believe with anything you want, and I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, even try to talk you out of them. But uh, uh, that doesn't uh, bear at all on the existence of of God, the issue that is uh, at hand. I don't see why it doesn't bear on the existence of God, because God is not purely objective in any sensible theology. Or God is not experienced purely objective. Okay, maybe there are, you know, such such aspects of God, but I'm I'm just I'm not talking again from a scientific point of view. I mean, you, if, you seem if to it's be not, if it's not objectivity that we're dealing with, then uh, I I don't have anything to say about it. I mean, you, you seem to take issue with the way that uh, Victor treats the, how Jesus Christ relates to God in in Christian theology. You, you say that in the book, um, you 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 reference. The one remark that, that that Victor makes, which is, um, in other words, God does not wish to spend eternity with all human souls, but only the chosen few who, by b- blind faith in the absence of all evidence, accept a Jewish carpenter who may or may not have lived 2,000 years ago as their personal saviour. Of course, this is hardly a new idea, but was essentially the teaching of John Calvin. And you say that that statement makes it abundantly clear that Victor doesn't understand the core theology of the Christian God. Now, why why do you feel it's so important that Victor does grasp this concept. What, why, why is it important for him to, to realise this concept of God? Why is his science lessened by the fact that he doesn't engage with, with that type of a... Well, ultimately, because it affects the whole way that you look at life. But to go back to something Victor said earlier, he said this was all... I can't remember what the phrase was. Faith, I think, was the word. They had no root in... Now. I don't think you can build Christianity on historical evidence, but there is a lot, Victor. Um, Very few people dispute that Jesus existed. Even Richard Dawkins, you know, atheists for Jesus, or Jesus for atheists, (laughs) I forget which way it goes. Um, There are one or two people who've written books arguing that he didn't exist. I'm not not using the argument that, uh, that Jesus didn't exist. I've just... I, I, I put it the way I did, which I think is accurate. He may or may not have existed. There is there is some possibilities, however slim. And, and you can't use the argument from authority. That doesn't do any good. I mean, he either existed or he didn't, yeah. uh, de- independent of, of what uh, the uh, people have, have written about the subject. The, but the fact is that he there was nothing written about him for 40 years uh, after his life. We have to rely on, on the stories that uh, these people got, however they did, by, uh, uh, you know, by uh, oral, testimony. Oral, oral testimony and so on. And, and, and you have to admit that that has well, to have some, some uh, unreliability to it, and that's all I'm saying, that it's not very reliable. Uh, the whole story. I, mean, I, I, I rely a lot on Bart Ehrman's uh, yes. interpretations. I, I, I think I think we don't want to too much digress into yeah. a, an argument over whether, right? Especially since so that's we, not we, my. We've, we've, I don't we've, want to claim that I'm a biblical scholar. And we've here, done so. many many a show on that in yes. other in other areas. But, yes. but but the point here, David, is it something along the lines of the fact that you feel that there is that, that even though you don't build the case for Christianity purely on the historical evidence, there is a historical basis on which. Christians make their claims about Jesus and, and who he was and who he said he was and and you, you seem to be the, the impression I get is that you don't feel that Stenger is Victor is prepared even for a minute to take seriously those kinds of not in a sense scientifically in the sense of the physicist science but but of a sociological type of science which asks could it be that the you know in this context those claims about Jesus' miracles and his resurrection, etc., were true. Is that where I'm? I, 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 you're, you're coming from? I think you've got it exactly right. Yes. Um. So, so the the the, the, the sense is um, when when scientists like Victor and Dawkins say, "Well, it's neither here nor there." All those stories about Jesus dying and rising again. You would say, "Well, that's not a very scientific approach. Why don't you actually go and look at the evidence and?" and well, if there were evidence, that would be wonderful. I mean, uh, I, I, I love the, I think it was Dawkins who came up with the suggestion that suppose uh, the bones of Jesus were discovered someday in in, in uh, Palestine uh, and that they were identifiable one way or another by DNA or whatever uh, as, as the actual bones of Jesus Christ. 
What, what a wonderful thing that would be, because on one hand, you'd have evidence that he existed, but on the other hand, <laughs> <laughs> you'd have a violation of the idea that he rose bodily well, to well, heaven. So, exactly, but, but uh, I mean, there are. There could be evidence. We, do, we regularly debate the evidence yeah. in just such a way. We don't obviously have physical evidence like that, but we have mm. the, 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 the evidence of what the early Christians believed and why they would have believed that, and would it have made sense for them to believe that in that in those situations? And, and there are many... Yeah. Good scholars but who you say also have, this, this is very good evidence you have, for have the resurrection. Strong evidence, I think, against uh, uh, against the fact that a uh, against the notion that uh, there was a crucifixion in in Jerusalem at that time, because there were Roman historians who should have written about it. You have strong evidence, strong archaeological evidence now that's I think irrefutable that the uh, exodus never happened, that Moses the Moses story is a myth. And Moses' story is fundamental to all three Abrahamic religions. So you have well, lots of stuff out there that I mean, I mean are... I'm sure all these things can be debated. I mean, yeah. I, I suppose at the core of it, though, is can, can we apply the scientific... Are you willing to even look at those kinds of claims? You bet. Because are you, though? I mean, have you, have you sat down and said to yourself, well, I'm going to... Yeah, I've looked at a lot of them. I look, look, I'm a physicist. I look... I'm interested in physical evidence, not arguments such as, well, you know, the, the, these these uh, disciples uh, must have really believed or else they wouldn't have given their lives. An argument like that, I think, is foolish well, well, because, because Japanese kamikaze pilots gave their lives, uh, <laughs> soldiers gave their lives to Hitler. Those kinds of arguments, sure. I think, I, are I mean, well, that's the point, though. But you're engaging with an argument. Uh, the problem is, surely, that we we can't give you a physical argument now because we're... 2,000 years after the event. Exactly. Now, does that mean that automatically, because it goes against the laws of nature, it's therefore ruled out of court for you? No, it's not ruled out. Maybe someday somebody will find something. Of course. I mean, for you, David, though, presumably that the, the, the inquiry is more than just inquiry into physics. We have to make arguments on the, the best knowledge we have. I think you have to arrive at it beyond the totality of your experience. And hard science is part of that and it's revolutionized the way we think we wouldn't be here doing this in the absence uh, of scientific thinking um, and what I'm trying to do is to make sense of my total experience and my total experience includes a great deal that Victor's not concerned with because it's not, it's not physical science it's, it's not, also your personal experience, it's subjective it's, it's, believe me I get into arguments exactly like this uh, with with uh, many scientists who are believers, and they bring up all these irrelevant matters. Namely, I you know I love my wife, so therefore uh, uh, there must be a god. I mean, that's the kind of argument people make. Well, I can't love my wife uh, because I'm an atheist. But believe me, I hear those those types of arguments. Is it irrelevant? I remember in a um, when John Lennox and Richard Dawkins debated uh, in yeah. Oxford, and when John Lennox brought up the issue of jesus christ and his resurrection dawkins essentially again dismissed it and said well that's just some story about a backwater peasant who uh, you know we have a few stories about and, and that's it i think christians get a bit um perhaps uh, frustrated when scientists who claim to examine everything with the rigor that they do then dismiss what where there is actually a great deal of work and time and scholarly sort of input has gone into actually examining whether these things happened or not and 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 is 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 there a problem here that because you've got your atheist worldview you say well that stuff i know didn't happen no, it's, uh, I, I mean no. it d does I, I mean we're open-minded at every level i'm richard dawkins gets carried away sometime and and and, and says extreme things but i think that uh, i haven't i have had a amateur interest in in the question of, of uh, Jesus Christ uh, all my life, and I've read a, a lot of stuff on it. and uh, But it just, just doesn't make sense to me that uh, we can know very much about anything that happened 2,000 years ago uh, when we don't, can't even believe everything we read in the New York Times today. Uh, the, the idea that uh, any kind of... Uh, of Accurate information could could have arrived uh, uh, to us today from that time, without there being something written down, without there being something physical. Uh, 
uh, is is uh, just strikes me as unbelievable. It just was the way that uh, there could have been. Uh, much uh, known from that period if it hadn't been written down in black and white. And there were people, there were historians at that time. There were historians living in Jerusalem at that time that didn't write any of these events down. So uh, it really well, looks suspicious to me that the, the, that this, this story is uh, all contrived, at least the, the, you know, the mythical story, the... Uh, the uh, not necessarily the existence of, of, of a person, but uh, the whole story built up around him. Well, there are many ways one could go from that, but part of the issue is how far truth can be conveyed and transmitted in the community and in its life. You seem to regard words, things written down on paper, as the only thing that really matters. Um, oh, even better than that would be things found on the ground, uh, physical objects that would be better than stuff written, written down on paper. You see, I'm interested in family history, and stories come down through families over several generations. And I've been prone to disbelieve many of these things that I've told, but having gone into the records, they, they're not usually right in the details. They get time wrong okay. and the various other things, but there is always something there. And you see, you quote one particular incident, say, there are millions of them. We're talking about a tradition which is embodied in the life of a community, which I share in, and you don't because you've chosen not to. We're going to take a quick break and uh, we'll be summing up our thoughts on today's program. Um, if you'd like to get in touch, as I say, as usual, the uh, internet, uh, the email address is um, unbelievable at premier.org.uk. You can also leave me a voicemail message and uh, I'll give you the details of how to do that a little later on as well. Don't forget our website, premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable, where you can hear today's program again. You can send on to a friend. Uh, you can also get involved at the Premier community there. Um, lots of discussions going on in the unbelievable forum. Uh, between atheists, Christians and people of other faiths. So uh, I do encourage you to get online and check that out. Premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. We'll be wrapping up our thoughts on today's programme in just a moment's time. Welcome back to Unbelievable. I'm Justin Briley. Uh, into the last segment of the show now. It's the show that gets Christians and non-Christians together every week here on Premier Christian Radio. Saturday afternoon right now, but you may be listening via the podcast, in which case it could be any day of the week at any time. And uh, however you're listening, it's great to have you with me. But if you are listening this Saturday afternoon, then uh, just a reminder that after this show, Hip Rock UK is with us. Uh, the very best in uh, contemporary uh, Christian music aimed at the youth market. And uh, after that, we've got Loretta Fenton Presents presenting some of the best unsigned Christian music talent in the UK. For the moment, um, let me tell you what's coming up next week at the same time, if you want to tune in. Uh, we're going to be hearing a debate between John Tancock, who's a Welsh apologist, uh, and he's uh, coming over into the studio and he's going to be talking to um, a person going by the name of B. Strong. Uh, it's a pen name, but they've written a book called Jesus is a Hoax. Uh, in it, they make some very interesting claims. They, he says that the Apostle Paul was mentally ill and that he was the proponent of effectively a hoax religion. Well, we're gonna, he's going to be contesting those claims. John Tancock joins me in the studio next week to uh, do that discussion with B. Strong, uh, who will be on the phone from the States. So uh, do join us for that. Should be a really interesting one. Uh, right now, time to get back into today's uh, final part of our debates with Victor Stenger. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. And we're uh, concluding our program today. Uh, Victor Stenger, the uh, atheist US physicist and author of God, the Failed Hypothesis, has joined me over the course of the last two weeks and today talking to David Bartholomew a Christian and uh, emeritus professor of statistics at the London School of Univers London School of Economics, even. Um, so, thanks, gentlemen, both for, for being with me today. It's it's been really great to get your interactions. Obviously, um, what you've been saying to some extent, David, is that we will, you know, we have different worldviews, we have different experiences, which give us, uh, if you like, <clears throat> different analysis. You know, we both have. You both, essentially, gentlemen, both have the same range of statistics and data available in front of you um, you draw one conclusion which is God does not exist from it Victor 
um, the conclusion that David draws is different, that God does exist. That, well, there's certainly nothing to disprove God's existence in the data we see in front of us. Um, I mean, someone might ask, you know, from the outset, is it even possible to put God in this context of, uh, you know, uh, a kind of effect to be to be judged in this way or another? Um, I mean, at the end of the day, surely... God, to some extent, is more, if you are trying to establish whether God is there, Victor, is more than just a scientific phenomena to be observed. Um, it's, it's got to be more than that, hasn't it? Well, it's absolutely, that's absolutely true. You could imagine all kinds of gods that uh, uh, w- would not be detectable. A de- the deist god, which incidentally is a god that more people actually believe in than you would think. Even the people who claim to be Christians uh, uh, they've been surveys now. Baylor University did a recent survey that showed that about 40% of the people who call themselves Christians actually didn't believe in a God that plays a, an important role in the universe and acts in their don't, lives. Don't believe in an interventionist yeah. God. Yeah, it? so so they're really deists, but they would not uh, even know what the word deist means in general. So they, they still call themselves Christians. So so you, you, you certainly have that. And uh, uh, the... The issue is 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 whether there, uh, you can deal with uh, uh, not a god of of every conceivable variety, but the god that uh, most people uh, worship, a god, or at least a, the god of the Judeo Christian Islamic tradition, a very active god, a god that plays an important role in the universe. Uh, and it's it's not that we are detecting the, anything about that god's. Uh, nature. Uh, when we when we do scientific experiments, what we're doing is we're looking for the phenomena that we would expect to result if, if such a god existed. Actual physical phenomena that uh, uh, would take place. I haven't talked at all about uh, about many of the things that were in in my book, where I argue that uh, God should have shown up in in the creation of the universe, in the in the design of nature. And, and, and so on. There are many, many other examples. And the prayer, prayer was not the only one. Revelation is another one, easily tested. If a person uh, 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 talks to God, if people have talked to God over the centuries, over the over the millennia, th- then somebody must have come back with some information that they could not possibly have known uh, before. That's certainly a testable phenomenon. You can test everybody who has a a uh, uh, claimed. Uh, a religious experience and see what they learn from that religious experience and then go and, and find out if it has anything to do with with the with reality it, I, I it would be it, all is, is the problem though that, that god <laughs> people's religious experience doesn't happen in the laboratory conditions of a of a test it it happens in normal life where yes, but even it, then, inevitably if somebody, it becomes somebody anecdotal came back, suppose somebody came back uh, and predicted the exact date of the next uh, Los Angeles earthquake, uh, just something like that. Uh, it would be hard to, again, give a natural explanation for this. And this is what I claim, that these are all phenomena uh, that uh, you wouldn't expect to work every time, but you'd expect the billions of times that people have prayed, the billions of times that people have, have had religious experiences at some place, sometime, there would have been some, some uh, result that could have been tested scientifically. But, but the, I suppose this is the problem, isn't it, that, that given the fact that there have probably been billions of prayers offered to God, I'm sure there are equally billions of people who claim they've heard from God, but it can't be subjected to a scientific test because it didn't happen in that environment. I mean, David, do, do you feel that um, anecdotal evidence, as it were, is, is a valid way of looking for God, even though we can't necessarily put it, put it to the... So you the sci- know, well, let's ask David what, what he thinks. Yeah. Well, I'm beginning to re- regret introducing the word anecdotal, um, because there is a, ca- a quality of, of evidence around it. There are vast amounts, um, which I agree individually don't count for very much. It's when they're taken all together the case begins to weigh up. I don't think Christian belief really rests ultimately on the kind of evidence that um, Victor is looking for, so I don't think he's ever going to find it. And if someone were to come up and tell me the date of the new, next Los Angeles earthquake and it, and it came to pass, I'd say, that's a funny sort of God. You know, That's not the kind of God I'm talking about. 
And I think this discussion, which I found very illuminating, has revealed a really fundamental difference between us about our conception of God. And unless we resolve that, we wouldn't get very much farther. Great. Right. Just ask you a question. You, you, you said that you talk about evidence and that, indiv- that it does not individually amount to much, but on the whole... That sounds like something that statistics is called meta-analysis. You must know about meta-analysis. It's, it's applied often in parapsychology. I've never seen a case of meta-analysis resulting in any, any um, major discovery. As far as I know, meta-analysis is a totally bankrupt way of, uh, of trying to analyze data. You're the statistician. What's, what's your uh, answer to that? I don't think it's true. I mean, meta-analysis is a big thing. There are conferences held on it. People go to it. Um, and it arises because there are a vast number of studies of almost everything you like. Yeah. And somebody says, what does all this add up to? That's what meta-analysis is about. Yes. Yes. Now, in the paper that Justin has referred to, I quoted an example you've given, because I don't think you've understood what it really is. You said, in effect, I th- this is not what you said, but this is, if we had ten cases, let's say, none of which were significant, how can we put those all together and say that is now significant? Well, you can, and there's a probability argument show that you can do it. And I think the reason you've fallen into trouble on that is you regard these decisions made on the basis of significance tests as utterly and finally and without any question. They're not. There's an element of chance in, and it can happen that evidence is cumulative. Science proceeds by accumulating evidence. It does add up. It isn't a series of separate packets. It's a kind of cumulative picture that the scientific community is somehow initiated into. I have never seen a major discovery in physics made in that way. Every major discovery in physics that I know of was made by one individual experiment being, being beautifully done and statistically significant on its own right, at a, at a probability level uh, of like one in ten thousand being 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 a random effect, and then other people coming along. It's not it's not necessary. That's not the final word. Uh, other people then come along, and and uh, uh, try to do the same experiment, uh, usually a little bit differently, but try to look for the same result. And when it's confirmed after several. Uh, tests, then you uh, then you believe in that phenomena, and that's that's every discovery I know of was discovered that way. Well, I think it's your disadvantage, Victor, to be a physicist. <laughs> I can, I mean, physics, in a sense, is relatively simple. Yes, you, know, you can right. control everything, and, I and think, you can I do think experiments in a laboratory. F- fits in best in that situation because you're dealing in physics. You're dealing with the most fundamental issues in the universe, the nature of matter and so on. And then with God, you're dealing certainly with one of the most fundamental issues of the universe. And the techniques that are used in physics would be, should be the most applicable to, uh, to the God question. I just don't agree, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you expect? Uh, well, absolutely. No, indeed. <laughs> um, very rarely do I expect agreement, much agreement in this studio. But thanks, gentlemen, for, for your um, uh, fascinating interaction today. Um, is God a failed hypothesis, we asked today? Uh, we were looking at it from a statistical point of view, and uh, we were looking at it last week from a philosophical point of view. Um, and uh, thanks, gentlemen, both for being... Now, uh, there's a couple of books floating around in the studio at the moment. Obviously, Victor's one here, um, which I think he's just signing for David as we speak. We're going to sign each other's... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Sign. That's not your... Uh, that's not my copy. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'll, g- I'll, g- I'll give you that one. <laughs> we'll sign it for me, at least. Well, yes, I'll sign that. What, what are we signing here? So, so Victor, you're signing David's... Uh, yes. edition of um, the God the, God the Failed Hypothesis. Now, David, what, what books have, have you written and, and uh, that uh, you will be signing for Victor? I have this one at home. I was thinking, <laughs> you sign it, but of course, that's not my copy. That's, that's, I, I wish I had brought that, it. That's the recent one, yes. um, have which read. we haven't discussed at all. Yeah. Um, well, give us the name of that so that people it's can... It's called God, Chance and Purpose. And who's that published by? Cambridge University Press. And it has a subtitle, 
Can God Have It Both Ways? Publishers like subtitles nowadays. <laughs> they do, sub- they? Subtitle that sells the book. <laughs> this book. And the real title. This book was good because it had two subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, so uh, well, we'll put a link to that book on the, the website as well, David, so that uh, people could, can find that. That's um, all. And, and um, just, just give us the title again of that latest book uh, from Cambridge University Press God, Chance, and Purpose. Excellent. And, uh, and that essentially continues your exploration of, of uh, the role of God in science and data and statistics. So thank you very much, gentlemen, both for, uh, for being with me on the programme. It's been fascinating to meet you, Victor. Yes, uh, a, a safe trip back to the US. And uh, I, I hope that maybe we'll get to talk again. Perhaps um, when this fine-tuning book comes out, we'll, we'll bring in um, a, a John Polkinghorne or an Alistair McGrath or yes, someone... Well- well, to, to, to debate we, we, you on we get back to London quite a bit because my wife uh, loves London, and and so uh, we uh, we, uh, we get here. To well, it would be great to see you next time. Basis. Next time you're in town, we could have a look at the the fine tuning arguments and the the arguments for and against. And I hope you've enjoyed the program today. Uh, keep listening. We're going to uh, round off today's program with a look at your feedback and comments uh, for the moment. My thanks to my guests. And uh, we'll uh, see you again, hopefully, at another point in the future. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the two weeks that Victor has spent as our special guest here on Unbelievable as much as I have. And I'm sure many of you wanting to get in touch. Uh, many of you have been in touch as well. So uh, why don't I go through some of the responses I received in regard to last week's programme? Um, a, a couple of people drawn me up on my presenting style of last week's programme, suggesting that I, I became too uh, involved myself on the side of the Christian <laughs> argument. Um, this one in particular from Matt says, uh, on the broadcast, Is God a Failed Hypothesis, program one, um, I felt that the debate between Stenger and Fuller, and you may remember it was Steve Fuller, our guest last week, uh, debating Victor, um, you say it was an unfair debate. Mr. Stenger not only had to debate Mr. Fuller, but also had to debate the interviewer of the debate. Uh, Mr. Stenger should have never have agreed to this debate. Um, well, it's interesting you feel that way. I, I don't think Victor particularly saw me as, you know, going for him too much. I, I, I like to... Pride myself on hopefully being somewhat neutral. Uh, obviously, I am a Christian myself, but uh, I, I, I hope I give a fair crack of the whip to both sides. Um, step in when necessary on either side, in, in a way. Um, uh, but uh, also someone else, and I'll come to that email later, felt that I lost my usual neutrality. <laughs> um, Xander, who's a regular emailer to the show and an atheist, says, After looking into this, I see that Steve Fuller didn't make any sense whatsoever. He doesn't actually claim to be a st- a scientist, but still, his view that without God there's no good reason to do science is just patently absurd. The deism of great thinkers such as Newton is quite different than theism, and besides, there are plenty of atheists who are quite happy to do scientific research, and plenty of atheist non scientists such as me who are thankful for the progress of science, in spite of the negative aspects that come with it. This was, of course, in response to Steve Fuller's contention last week that science has always historically been um, done within the context of a Christian worldview, and that it really Knows it's the actual quest for understanding and knowledge is because we have in mind that there is some objective aim, some uh, goal, some purpose out there that um, a transcendent God is the best explanation for. Well, um, Xander took issue with that. Um, let's hear from uh, an, someone on the phone who took issue with that as well. Uh, hi, Justin. It's Alex from Peterhead. I just wanted to take issue uh, uh, with something that your Christian guest Stevens uh, said. Um, specifically his insistence that science is somehow reliant on Christian principles, belief in God, whatever. Um, I think the key questions are, how many scientific experiments could not be successfully carried out by an atheist? I think it's none. Uh, How many applications for scientific funding require mention of God? Well, none. Um, The fact that our world is governed by certain laws and principles, uh, I think is something empirically testable, and the assumption that they apply uniformly elsewhere in the universe is an inference from observation and evidence not something we need theologians to tell us. Um, I don't think it matters if a scientist's reason for rolling out of bed in the morning is to serve the Lord. Uh, the important question is whether the science requires God or belief in God uh, to be of use to us. And I think the evidence is clear that it doesn't. 
Anyway, thanks for another interesting debate. Thank you very much, Alex, for getting in touch. 08456 52 52 52. If you want to do the same by phone, select option 8 when you get there. 08456 52 52 52. I mean, I would say I don't think Steve is in any way suggesting that science can't work. You know, you have to be a Christian to be able to do good science. That wasn't the 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 point of his argument at all i think it was more that um atheism uh, is would be a block to science in in terms of the if if that had been the if you like the the hot house in which science had developed um he he just didn't think that that actually gives a kind of an end view that that makes science work um but uh, Obviously, it's a controversial view, but uh, we do host them here on the show. Jacob M. says, if you could ask your guests, what does the art in science tell us, for example, of the placement of the eyes, the nose, the ears, etc.? We needed eyes, one in front and one on the back of the head would increase our chances of survival and so on. But who's responsible for the perfect placement and beauty of these things interesting question jacob i'm not quite sure where you're getting at with that where are you suggesting that in a sense there's a, there's a beauty that we recognize to our faces which isn't actually necessarily advantageous to our survival i'm not i'm not quite sure where you're coming from with that one here's here's matt though uh, matt works in the whole area of science um great to have you listening to the show matt you say you listen to it weekly now for the last six months and have found it very helpful personally you say i'm a molecular biologist with a doctorate and several years research in a postdoctorate position so i found the discussion on is god a failed hypothesis particularly interesting i hope you found today's interesting as well matt you say a couple of points i'd like to make i'm a christian and i approach my science in pretty much the way that steve fuller suggests my investigation of molecular biology is fueled by my desire to understand god The fantastic beauty that I find in biology fits perfectly with my understanding of a mighty creator. So Victor Stenger's assertion that someone like me has to have my science and my religion in two separate halves of my brain is just plain wrong and insulting. Never mind that many pioneers of science had the same attitude. And I know some colleagues who see it as I do, and I'm not even American or living in America. Actually, it was this point of Victor's that just made me respond by email. I couldn't not respond. I won't respond to all of the points that Victor made that I thought needed correcting. Steve did a fair job, I thought, and you too, when you almost forgot to be an objective moderator. But towards the end of the discussion, Victor claimed that the God explanation is a science stopper. And Steve didn't address this point. Well, what Victor doesn't seem to understand is that science is a quest for explanations. And when it finds a good explanation for a particular phenomenon it will stop any further search. In that sense, science is trying to end itself, ultimately. If we had perfect knowledge, I, as a scientist, would be out of a job. The claim that the God explanation is a science stopper is also very simplistic. It isn't as though the pioneers of science, most of whom were theists of one strain or another, simply dropped their hands and walked away from science. Rather, their view of God guided their science, not stopped it. Actually, the same could be said of much of atheistic explanations. In my own area of research, for example... The idea that most of our genomes are just junk DNA meant that research on that junk was apparently pointless. It guided people away from studying the junk. But thanks to maverick scientists, we are now in a position of questioning whether there really is any junk DNA. In fact, some of the most important regulatory elements in our genome are recovered from the so-called junk DNA. For me personally, I could never happily reconcile junk DNA with a creator god. And this has definitely prevented me from making the same mistake and treating DNA as junk. This has saved me quite a lot of time in my research program. So to summarise my point here, the claim that the God explanation stops science is too simplistic. It would be more accurate to say that it can guide science, just as atheistic assumptions can also guide science for better or worse. Well, thank you. Um, You say it was a long email and feel free to ignore any part of it. But uh, I actually read the whole thing there, Matt. Really interesting. Thank you for your your interactions there. Um, So quite a bit of reaction there to that show last week with uh, Victor Stenger. Um, thanks to all those who have emailed in. Uh, and don't forget uh, this week's show with Victor and David Bartholomew. Um, we'd appreciate your thoughts on that too. Um, what did you think of uh, David's critique of Victor's approach, uh, his approach to trying to assess scientifically uh, the odds that God exists given the, uh, the, the the experiments that have been conducted along those lines? Uh, as usual, email address unbelievable at premier.org.uk. There's also a good discussion going on at the Unbelievable Forum in regard to Stenger's appearance on the program. Uh, if you want to check that out, just go to the webpage premier.org.uk forward slash 
unbelievable. Click through to the Premier community via the icon there and you will uh, find a whole range of debates going on at the unbelievable group of the Premier community, including that one on on Stenger's appearance last week. OK, uh, let's just quickly see if we can squeeze in a couple in regard to um, that show those shows on homosexuality we did a, about a month or so ago now um still getting your your feedback on that thanks very much to uh, nick who got in touch uh, to say he wanted to address one of the non-christians who wrote in to say that uh, homosexual behavior shows up in the animal world so therefore we should see it as natural um nick says i say very well so does the eating of one's own young do you want to see us to see that as normal and natural i really don't think the animal world is the world to take our moral cues from. Um, You also wanted to take issue with the writer who complained about the nature of this program. That was a Christian writer who said that uh, we don't have enough uh, biblically conservative views on the program. And you wanted to say, Nick, you felt that was unfair and that if you want a biblically conservative view anyway, you've been on the program and uh, you'd be happy to come back on. And also on the issue of homosexuality, Nick Quinn wrote in to say that um, he really enjoyed the programs. Uh, Mike Dark was the uh, professing Christian who is also uh, a gay and um, you say you absolutely loved his attitude whilst talking to John Richardson on the topic of homosexuality but you say emotionally I too understand and would like the Bible to condone homosexuality because I feel it is part of the identity of many struggling believers but I cannot justify um, and I, I, I think you meant Mike here presumably in the context of what you're saying I cannot justify Mike's position using the biblical text although I do appreciate his ministry and support his love for people and God anyway thank you very much uh, for getting in touch Nick if I have misunderstood your comment there on the homosexuality uh, do get in touch again but um, you also wrote in about biblical slavery which was um, a program of a couple of weeks ago and I'm going to save that over for next time because we're out of time right now Um, So thank you for getting in touch. And don't forget, as I say, the email address. uh, And I do try to respond personally to any new emailer. Um, Do tell me as well where you're listening and how you came across the show. Unbelievable at premier.org.uk. Look forward to hearing from you. And you can look forward to another edition of Unbelievable at the same time next week. Back to the sort of bread and butter of this show. We're asking, is Christianity a hoax? You're unbelievable. And we're asking that in the context of um, one particular sceptic was a Christian, now a not a Christian, and you'll find out why next week. Uh, he's going to be joining us by phone from the States. Be Strong is his pen name. He's written a book called Jesus is a Hoax. Uh, in particular, we'll be looking at his claim that the Apostle Paul was mentally ill, and he was the proponent of this hoax religion. Um, we'll be finding out why Be Strong believes that. In a conversation with him, John Tancock, who's an apologist from Wheels, So um, you can expect an interesting discussion next week between uh, these two guys. Uh, So I do hope you can join me at the same time as per usual. In the meantime, have a great week. And I look forward to seeing you at the same time here on the show that gets you thinking.